It's nine. Hey, good morning. Nice. 9.30 a.m. Today is Thursday, September 3rd. My name is Brian Zumwalt. I'm the director of the county's Office of Technology and Innovation. I'll be playing the role of technology moderator for today's virtual meeting. On the panel with me is Don Kroll from the county attorney's office. He'll be serving as process moderator. And uh, before we start the meeting, I'd like to do a quick roll call, make sure we've got communications for each commissioner. Uh, let's start with Commissioner Eggers today. Good morning, Brian. I'm here. Good morning, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Seal. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Commissioner Welch. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, sir. Commissioner Long. Oh, I see Commissioner Long's on the phone. Commissioner Long, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yes, I'm here. Thank you. All right. Good to see you. I was talking to the technology guy. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Justice. Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Commissioner Peters. Good morning, Brian. And Commissioner Gerard. Good morning, all. All right. Hey, um, this is a regular work session, but we have an item that we need to vote on this morning. So we will have um, citizens comment for both, well, just general topics and the first item on the agenda, which is the local state of emergency. We will not take comment on the other two items on the agenda because this is a work session. So Brian, what do we have? At this time, if there are any members of the public that wish to wish to be heard this morning, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand virtually in the Zoom, Zoom meeting or hit star nine if you're on the telephone. And Madam Chair, it appears we have about nine people that wish to be heard this morning. Uh, we'll start with Don Bowler. Uh, Don, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Uh, yes, good morning, Don Bowler, B as in boy, O-H-L-E-R, address is 6678 54th Avenue North, St. Petersburg. Uh, last week, Saturday through Sunday, we had 494 cases, averaging 70 per day, 0.05% per population, and 0.25% of total tested at 197,002, and only out of 20% of the population. Last week, jo Dr. Jameson stated that the hospitalized number was higher than he wanted to see it. We have 141 admitted, 40 in ICU, 25 on ventilators, down from 330 admitted, 68 in ICU, and 31 on ventilators from Dr. Cho's August 6th statement. What is a national or set, state set criteria? And I thought we were talking science, not feelings or wants. Uh, Dr. Cho, speaking of science, spell it out. To my knowledge, you have not used your time about specific studies other than saying there, that there are. And please use studies prior to 2019 2019, not something cooked up to fit the narrative. Also, your 3.3%, uh oh, oh no, hang on, I'm having a technical issue here. Um, your 3.3 fatality rate is offensive. That percent is based off the cumulative deaths to a cumulative positive results that just continue to grow, so the percent will never go down. But that seems to be the plan. To get 3.3% down by half by your calculations, we would need to have 39,756 positive cases, double from where we're at now with no more deaths. You have created an impossible situation and a plateau. Commissioner Welsh, your vote based on a few calls last week was rather improper, so I created a poll that I did email to you that spread throughout the county for three days. I come to you today with the voice of 557 fellow constituents against your mandate to 137 that are four. Waiting three to four incubation periods due to the start of school proves there is no science in the mask because waiting contradicts the effectiveness you all so strongly claim. Uh, now, Commissioner Long, grandparents influence, but moms, there's a reason we're referred to as mama bear. The statement of your grandchild is a typical brainwash response and to put a perceived prevention of illness or death on the shoulders of our children is child abuse. Forcing them to feel a certain way when the drill is heard everywhere does not allow them to express their feelings, instead suppresses them because they know what is supposed to be said and they say it to satisfy, not from understanding. It's a result of conditioning to the desired response. This is part of what my eighth grade daughter's response was to an introduction assignment. I used to love going to school, running around and hanging out with friends. Now we are forced to wear masks and stay away from each other for our own safety. I tried two days of wearing that mask and going to school to be a kid, but I couldn't handle it. So I had to switch to virtual online. It was a tough and lonely decision, but it had to be made. Do you not realize our children are too young to bear this burden? And I know you don't have jurisdiction over the school board, but Dr. Cho directly advises them as well. 
Um, finally, the local state of emergency allows you to receive federal funds. I understand that, but the ordinance is only connected to the state of emergency because of you. It's time to take your heel off our throats, give us the freedom to manage ourselves, and remember, as my dear friend Pam so eloquently put it, the road to hell is paved with intentions, whether good or bad. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Aiden Barnes. Uh, Mr. Barnes, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, give us your spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Um, let's see, hi there. Um, my name is Aiden Barnes and that's A-D-E-N-B-A-R-N-E-S. And my address is 10240 127th Avenue in Largo. I have some comments on agenda two. As a resident of Largo for nearly, nearly a decade, I'm proud to have Curtis Holmes as my local Largo commissioner. Largo is a great community. First, I'd like to address in-person meetings for the commissioners. There were more callers against the mask mandate on the lines last week. Unfortunately, the lines were cut off. I believe it was by Pat Gerard before some of those callers were able to speak. And then Commissioner Welch counted the callers for and against the mask mandate but those were not even accurate numbers because so many were not allowed to speak. And I felt like that meeting was very hurried. I was lucky enough to get on the lines just in time, but I just didn't understand why that happened. If there were in-person meetings, I feel like the citizens of Pinellas could each have a voice to speak at these meetings if they wanted to speak. The school board is meeting in person. I've watched last week's meeting. They're taking necessary precautions, social distancing, I'd like to ask, when will the commissioners start meeting in person too? I mean, schools are open, other government entities are having in-person meetings. I feel like we should too. Um, members of the board, I'm asking, please do not renew the face covering ordinance. It has been over two months since the original order took effect. And my second question is how long will the order stay in place? And what are you looking for to end the order? The people in this county have a right to know what criteria the board is waiting for to repeal this mask ordinance. Is it hospital bed availability or a combination of factors such as low rates of positive case numbers? The number of cases continue to drop and I was studying the dashboard this morning. It looks like there was one death in all of Pinellas this week. I could be wrong, but that's what it looked like because it's dropped so low. Last week, the board mentioned waiting to see what will happen with schools reopen. Now that schools have reopened, what factors specifically are you looking for to rescind the mask order? The majority of residents in this county do choose to wear masks of their own free will, but we would like that freedom back to make the best choice for ourselves and our family. Many studies that I've researched point to the information that asymptomatic people are not spreading this virus as frequently, and especially when they are social distancing, which masks does not take the place of social distancing. And... No. According to the CDC, the death rate in my age group of 30 to 39, which are labeled COVIDs, we know not all are, but it's only about close to 1%. That means close to 99% of people under the age of 40 will, will recover from coronavirus. And that number goes up substantially as the younger person is. According to death rates that are labeled COVID, ages 18 to 29 have a half percent chance of death from COVID. Children under 18 have such a slim percentage, it's less than 0.1% but yet they're wearing masks in school. I want to address every listener under the age of 40. Why are we allowing masks to be forced on us? The virus is Ms. seriously- Barnes, yes. I'm sorry, your time has expired. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is David Happ. Uh, Mr. Ha Mr. Happ, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, give us your spelling and, and last name, I'm sorry, spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hey, my name is David Happy, spelling H-A-P-P-E at 903 Cypress Cove Way in Tarpon Springs. Thank you, sir. I want an apology to the Pinellas County Commissioners. For the past four weeks, I've been asking you the same question, which is what is the specific criteria you are using to make the mask ordinance in Pinellas County optional? What metrics are you using to modify or repeal your ordinance? And I owe you all an apology. I've been asking you a question that I didn't realize you couldn't answer. You have no idea what the criteria is because you put the mandate in place without having any specific expectation of how you would remove it. And you've indicated now that the decision is not yours, but you're waiting on your medical experts to make the decision. You don't have the answer because you never asked the question and you talked past Commissioner Peters and Commissioner Eggers when they did ask the question. 
and you're waiting on someone else to provide you with this answer. In the future, I would suggest you never enact an emergency ordinance unless you know how you're going to remove it. So Dr. Cho, your commissioners who along with the county administrator get paid a collective million dollars per year of taxpayer money, put in a face mask ordinance in June at your recommendation, months after your suggestion to flatten the curve for 15 days at the end of March. 177 days later now, and apparently we're still flattening the curve. Our million dollar commission doesn't have the foresight as to how they'd remove the ordinance they passed requiring citizens to wear medical devices. They're waiting on you. So what specific criteria, Dr. Cho, are you waiting on? You were originally looking to flatten the curve, but our hospitals are closing the COVID capacity they never used. Death toll was your next metric, but the catastrophic death toll never materialized. You told us to flatten the curve for hospital capacity, but hospitals laid off staff. You told us to stay home and we did. You told us to close businesses and sadly we did. You told us to wear masks and we did. You told us to look for positivity decreases below 5% and they're way below that. Although Pinellas for some reason continues to ignore the current CDC recommendations, still trying to keep this alive by using taxpayer money to test non-symptomatic people. The opposite, literally the opposite of what the CDC is telling you to do. Seems like someone here has an interest in keeping this going. We don't even care if you rescind the mandate completely, make it optional. We don't care if you keep face masks in place for the rest of your life. If you want people to wear a mask, let them wear a mask. Please give us your criteria, Dr. Cho, as the buck ultimately rests with you, apparently not our commissioners, as to how we make this optional. And to the Pinellas County Commission that seeded your decision making with no criteria, no data, no metrics, no accountability, please never put your citizens in this position again. This is Governance 101. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Dave Waddell. Mr. Waddell, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Good morning, folks, honorable chair, board, and staff. Um, regarding combining citizens to be heard with agenda items, I'm all of my years of experience, I have, I've never heard of this, so I expect to speak on the emergency order and under citizens to be heard today. Uh, this meeting process needs to be defined, combining workshops with actual uh, meetings. I've, I've never heard of that either. Uh, but as I requested last week, um, I'm concerned about this 250 acres we wanted to set aside. And I'm wondering if you can give me an update on when we're going to bring that as an agenda item. Now, I was hoping I didn't have to bring this up, but I'm going to bring it up. Uh, underneath the government organizational flow chart, you'll all look that up. I'm sure you're aware of it. Citizens are at the very top. Below us is the Board of County Commissioners. You work for us. We pay your salary. We pay our taxes. And my gosh, we've been really, really understanding. There's no question about the mass border. Uh, we're not out of this yet. It's time to accelerate and keep the foot on the gas. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to name names here, but when someone tells me uh, from the board that I get one shot to be heard, that's ridiculous. I can speak on every agenda item, and then I didn't even get a chance to talk about my good friend, Commissioner John Maroney. That was an outstanding individual. Like many others we've been blessed with throughout the years, David Healy, John Cueva, um, I want complete transparency here. And I think our citizens should be heard. As the woman said earlier, they cut people off. No, your job is to sit there and hear us out. All right, period. If we fill out cards, I used to be able to have five people fill out a card so I could speak for 10 minutes. I can't do that now anymore. But I do want to keep this Zoom thing going because I want to talk to you and I want to hear you. You're our leaders, all right? And we expect nothing but the best from you and that you have provided. I'm gonna give you that. I wouldn't want your job. You couldn't pay me enough. But I do wanna speak on the emergency order next. Rolling these things together. I only get three minutes. Hey, I want another three minutes, okay? 
I pay good money and I make the time to respect you. Please respect us as your citizens. My God, we're trying to support your efforts. And I know your hands are tied. But the reason I want to talk about things in this emergency order is the bigger problem is ventilation. Now, I mentioned this two months ago. Mr. Waddell, now, your three minutes has expired, sir. I'm going to get three minutes on the emergency order, correct? Yeah. What? No, sir, you're not. Why am I not, Pat? Because this is a work session, Dave, and I told you before that this, that your opportunity to comment, you just used up complaining. Well, about well, one shot, as you said, right? Is that it? That's right, because this is a work session. Well, it's not listed as a work session on the agenda. Well, actually it is. Oh, is it? Well, why don't you take a look, unless you've changed have, it already. We will have a regular meeting next week. Oh, and then, and then we'll have more than three minutes to speak. Well, between now and then, you better start looking into ventilations and having Madam, a, at least Chair, a MERV 13. Your time is up. All right, Madam Chair, we have 13 remaining speakers on the uh, agenda here. Our next speaker is Vicki Love. Uh, okay. Vicki, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes. Uh, hi, I'm Vicki Love. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm a registered Pinellas County voter. I live at 1185 Nelson Street in Dunedin, and I'm here to talk about the Douglas Hackworth property. A home development will significantly impact this area. It will destroy habitat that's used by many, many species, some of which are threatened, and it includes rural ecosystems like the rosemary scrub that's been decimated across Florida by development projects. Given the environmental sensitivity of the area and the fact that environmental impacts aren't constrained by property lines, they affect a much, much larger area. Not only will allowing this development go forward wreak havoc on the largest undeveloped tract in Pinellas County, the ripple effects will be felt far wider than that area. I know that property is under contract, but I think we still have a chance at this. And I understand the area is eligible for a matching Florida Forever grant that coupled with county dollars should put us within the purchase price point for the property. We're so lucky that a grant exists that allows us to help stretch the budget to be able to purchase and acquire and preserve such an important piece of property. So I want the commissioners to please find a way to fund the purchase of this precious land. It's far too unique to let it slip through our fingers and we're already the most densely populated county in Florida. We need more green space. So be innovative, form partnerships, find a way to make it happen, please. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have 12 remaining speakers with their hands up. Our next speaker is Devin Waite. Uh, if, Devin, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, we have three minutes to address the board. Okay, my name is Devin Waite, D-E-V-Y-N-W-A-I-T-T, -T, 925 Guilford Street, Oldsmar, Florida. I'm also calling about the Douglas Hackworth property. I would like to hear more from Commissioner Burton. It is my understanding that he was leading the county effort on this project. Primarily, I wanna know if there are any efforts being put forth to find ways to persuade Pulte to drop out of the sale during this due diligence period. If there's something to be hopeful about, we would love to hear it, as opposed to helplessly waiting as the fate of this land rests in the hands of a developer. I would also like to understand more clearly how and very potentially why this happened. It seems there are no shortage of creative ways the funding for this could have been arranged. And obviously the conservation of this land is something very important to the residents of this county. So it's somewhat befuddling that our elected officials were unable to get it together to make this happen. What I do know is that the messaging from both the county and the city on this issue has been grossly misleading. They're trying to spin the story to make it out like the estate went for a higher offer when the truth is that the county never made the estate an offer. When I confronted Commissioner Gerard's office with this fact, I heard backpedaling about how they were in the process of creating a list of properties and hadn't gotten around to making an offer yet, which is understandable, even though it's not the story they're trying to sell the public. But the idea that the sale to Pulte was news to both the county and the city is an outright lie. The estate notified the county that they would be listing the land with a broker on July 1st and that it would likely sell fast, essentially giving them a speak now or forever hold your peace moment. And the county did not act. So again, what I want to know is why. If this just fell through the cracks, which is absolutely baffling given its importance, how did this happen? There was a lot of talk at the city meeting on Tuesday about not pointing fingers, and I feel just the opposite. I wanna know exactly who was responsible for this. This is no small issue. 
This is destruction and devastation of something crucial and very dear to Pinellas County. And it's forever. Once this is gone, we don't get it back. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have 11 remaining speakers. Our next speaker is on the telephone line, last four digits 1419. Uh, if you can go ahead and give us your name, address, spelling, and you'll have three minutes to address the board. And you'll have to unmute, by the way. Last four digits, one, four, one, nine. If you'll go ahead and unmute yourself, you'll have three minutes. And Madam Chair, we might have to go back to this one. It doesn't appear that he or she is unmuting her line. Um, I'll go to our next speaker, which is Virginia. Uh, Virginia, I don't have a last name. So if you can give us your first last name, spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello, my name is Virginia da or Frizzle, I'm sorry, Frizzle 14956, Crown Drive, Largo, Florida, 33774. Thank you. Um, I'm calling for the mask face covering mandate to vote no. Again, it's been quite some time now that you uh, mandated this and it's evident that the numbers are coming down. You are aware that um, even the CDC has taken the death toll from 153,000 deaths to confirm deaths of 9,210 opposed to 153,000. So they are seeing the changes and they are making note of it. And maybe you don't see it so much, but what if that is the truth? And um, they are saying that is the truth under the radar. Um, also, as far as the govern as the POTUS goes, it was proposed state or regional gating criteria, symptoms, downward trajectory of influenza like illness reported within 14 days, or downward trajectory of COVID like symptoms cases reported within 14 days. Well, we've been with you for 14 days now. And over 14 days, we have definitely clarified that our numbers are coming down and have at least plateaued for now. Cases, downward trajectory of documented cases within a 14 day period. Cases, downward trajectory of a positive test as percent of total tests within a 14 day period. As we know, they're coming down and we've been told by CDC that asymptomatic, asymptomatic symptomatic people don't necessarily have to be tested anyway right now, which you're um, using money to do anyway. Um, so therefore those cases are not gonna be necessarily accurate. Hospitals treat all patients without crisis care, big time. Treat all patients without crisis care. Robust testing program in place at risk healthcare workers, including emerging antibody testing, all done. And our hospitals are not overloaded. Would you like our, your public to visit hospitals every day and make no? Do you want us to become your media and check on these things that you're telling us that we obviously know are not necessarily true, that the hospitals are not full? They're not full of COVID patients. Thank you, God, that people are not dying. Thank you, God, that 99.66 people are going to live from this. I do not understand. I'm a naturopathic doctor for over 20 years in this county. I do not understand how you can base us wearing masks and you can at least cut it down. Another note, if you go to Miami-Dade, they've at least you're... told us what to do. You got people driving in cars with masks on. We have a very... People are, do expired, not understand. You need to point out what not to do. Look at the mandated day. They've at least told them not to drive in cars with masks on. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is on the telephone line at last four digits, 5195. If you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your first, last name, spelling, and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello? Yes, my name is Dawn Lechner, D-A-W-N-L-E-C-H-N-E-R. My address is 1511 Lemon Street in Clearwater, Florida. Um, I just wanted to call in to you. I thank you that you're having this meeting. I wanted to uh, agree with Mrs. Barnes, um, Ms. Bowler, and Mr. Happy 
Um, I think they've been very thorough, so I'm not going to go through all the things that they did. Um, the research is well known, but they're asking you uh, to do your job and they're asking for some specific criteria uh, to end this mass mandate, yet you don't supply it for us. And so I just wanted to ask you to have, you know, do your due diligence and to supply these things for us as it seems endless. And it also seems as though, you know, we just keep moving forward without any understanding or any criteria or any hope. And so um, that's all I really have to say today. I thank you for listening to me and have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Madam Chair, our next speaker, I don't have a first or last name for it, it says Sivarts. Uh, so if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your first last name, spelling and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Uh, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, yes, my name is Cheryl Everts. My address is 707 182nd Avenue E, Reddington Shores. Um, First, I want to start, this should be brief. I just want to start off by congratulating my fellow citizens who are speaking out about the face covering mandate. I, uh, I don't agree with this mandate. I think it's time to lift this emergency order and provide, restore our, our liberty to us. And if you don't, I'm afraid that your constituents are going to start demanding it. I want to say what I've seen so far from this panel, that I see a couple of death spots that sit here like there are parents trying to rule over their disobedient children. But I want you to know that your constituents are waking up. I would also like to mention upcoming elections. And I know some of you are running and I just want you to know that citizens are now more informed about this panel of commissioners and what's happening here. I would like to recommend that you hold meetings outside of business hours, because like me, I had to take time off of work to attend, to see what you're doing. And I think for the, for the benefit of transparency, it might be beneficial that you hold these meetings outside of hours so that other constituents who work for a living can attend, can listen, can supply their comments as well. I would also like to hear from you regarding the uh, emergency order. I would like to know how your, what your criteria is for continuing on with this. And I would like to hear facts, not correlations to articles with agenda-driven dribble, um, actual facts and what facts you are using as criteria to lift this order. Um, that's all I had this morning. So thank you for listening. You. Madam Chair, we have 10 speakers remaining. Our next uh, speaker is Karen Mullins. Ms. Mullins, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Good morning, commissioners. This is Karen Mullins, M-U-L-L-I-N-S, then even Florida. Thanks for listening to me this morning. I am thoroughly for face masks with the obvious um, data that's coming out. They're working. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Have a good day. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Christy Alvarez. Ms. Alvarez, if you go ahead and mute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. My name is Christy Alvarez. Last name is spelled A-L-V-A-R-E-Z. -E I live in Largo, Florida. Um, and unlike the Karen before me, I strongly disagree with this mask mandate. For three months, I have listened in on these meetings silently from the sidelines. I've heard residents pleading for you to put aside emotion and politics and end this ridiculous mandate. Today, I feel like I can't be silent anymore. And as much as many of you don't want to hear us, our voices will not be silenced. Since you put this mass mandate into effect, you have repeatedly failed to answer simple questions from the public regarding what the criteria is for ending it. Week after week, we hear from the same so-called experts speaking to numbers that are skewed at best, never once hearing from another professional who might challenge your biased agenda. This is unacceptable. The people of Pinellas County aren't as stupid as your continuous smirks and eye rolls would have you believe. We are banding together in groups large and loud, and it's not gonna end well for this power-hungry, overreaching commission. 
you should not underestimate the power of social media and our ability to pay attention to what you're doing. I, for one, started paying attention when you tried to pass the ridiculous Bunces Pass Lagoon issue quietly under our noses. We all know what the outcome of that was because we spoke up and you were forced to listen. That was only the beginning because now we are awake and we're paying attention. And at the end of the day, you work for us, the citizens of this county. End this ridiculous mass mandate and let people be responsible for their own actions and health. If anything good has come from COVID, it's that there are more eyes on this commission now than ever before. Come November, there are a couple of you who should be prepared to retire because you will be voted out. And since I have a few seconds to spare, I'm just gonna say this to my friends and people listening at home, vote for Tammy Vasquez and Larry Ahern on November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have about 12 people that have their hands up still. Um, our next speaker is Nicole Matthews. Uh, Ms. Matthews, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Nicole Matthews. Matthews is M-A-T-T-H-E-U-S. I'm calling from Dunedin, Florida. Um, I wanted to speak on two topics. The first one was the mask mandate. I do support this and, and thank you for um, mandating that. Um, it is a fact that they're working. That's why the numbers are coming down. So thank you. Um, the second topic I was hoping to speak about um, really is just kind of reiterating what some other people have been speaking about with the Douglas property. Um, so I know Devin Wade and a few other people have spoken about it so far. Um, just wondering why this is still not a agenda item. I don't know. Um, what needs to happen to make it a more active agenda item. I know we had a working meeting the other day. Um, I am waiting to hear um, when our next update on this process will be for gaining uh, a plan, an actual financial plan to acquire this property if the Polt Home contract does not go through. Um, I also wanted to say that, you know, I'm very disappointed finding out as Devin, Devin Waite pointed out, very disappointed finding out that the commission or um, certain people on the commission were actually told July 1st that you know it was either make an offer on the property or forever hold your peace. And um, we were told the opposite of that. We were told that the commission was not aware that it was going to be going under contract. Um, so I'm disappointed in this. And I would like to know what we can do to prevent this from happening in the future, to prevent such a uh, purchase of land um, to be falling through the cracks. If that could be addressed, um, that would be, I'd be very thankful for that. And um, that's it. Thank you. Madam Chair, there are 11 speakers that remaining to be heard. Our next speaker is Yvette Gage, G-A-U-G-H. Uh, Yvette, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Yeah, hi, my name's Yvette Gaw, 9371 Blind Pass Road, St. Pete Beach. Um, I did want to address some of the callers. It stated that the numbers are down and the masks are working. That is a false statement. And I didn't want to mislead any callers that are on the line. As your doctors know, that is the natural course of a virus. I have recently sent in a letter and I'm going to read that just in case some of you happen to miss it. Miss it. I'm, re I'm respectfully asking for you to please review the numbers in the United States as well as the state of Florida. I attached to my letter two snapshots from the CDC that shows the numbers are down, that we've not only flattened the curve, we're upside down and then some. We have to stop perpetuating fear. The average mortality rate in the US is 78. The average mortality death for the death rate for COVID is 78. The average individual who dies has 2.5 comorbidities. Our children are being abused by mandating them to wear masks in school. Common sense tells you they are not a threat to themselves or to their teachers. The science has shown that. The ramifications will be immediate, not just immediate, it will not be immediate, but long-term. Unfortunately, our children are the guinea pigs. They lose neurological connections and desensitization. It's creating a loss of empathy and is developing a cold generation. My heart hurts and pains for these children, telling them to stay away. I recently saw a, an, an announcement by Fauci telling the, the kids to wear their masks, you're being a good little boy and good little girl and stay away from each other. That is not how we grow as individuals. 
And it is ironic that the very thing you all are claiming to do is to protect us, thinking that we don't have brains for ourselves. This is not what they thought it was and the numbers prove it. And on a daily basis, I meet individuals having a very difficult time breathing, they have headaches and more. People are afraid to walk down the street next to people because of the fear that has been instilled in them. And if they really think the mask is what is protecting them, then we have a very unintelligent species walking around this planet. There are many, many studies showing the inefficacies of wearing a mask. And I understand you have two doctors on the board. However, there are thousands of doctors that disagree with them. I would have more respect if they would have even one time mentioned to build your immune system, to get outside and get fresh air than, than proclaiming that a mask is protecting them and actually speak honestly. They absolutely know better. Maybe I need to educate them. So a little bit about masks, carbon dioxide and waste gas gets trapped in the mask and you rebreathe re it back in, which is very harmful. People who already have health challenges and they wear a mask, it's only exasperating their health condition. And if they don't wear a mask, then they're yelled at. So they're scared to go in a store, even if they have COPD. And I met someone just like that because they, they're, they're fearful of someone yelling at them. Ms. Gow, I'm sorry, your time has expired, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is a Dr. Levine. I don't have a first and last name. So Ms. Levine, if you'll, Mr. Or Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Levine, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record. Yes, it's, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it's Dr. Elena Levine, E-L-E-N-A, L-E-V-I-N-E, -E -E, 936 Virginia Street in Dunedin. Thank you. Thank you. I was uh, very impressed with your doctors and experts at the last meeting I spoke at and sent an uh, email and spoke then. The same is still true, only more so now. I'm very concerned that this has become politicized and that I'm hearing people quote false science. We need actual facts, not alternate fake facts. At least f approximately 40% of the people with COVID are walking around with no symptoms at all and don't ever get a symptom. There are clear scientific demonstrations of particle dispersion without and with masks and with face shields and what the differences are. We absolutely need good public health to base this on and I hope you will again listen to your experts and your physicians and not just the public who has feelings about this. We need science, not feelings. We have influenza coming. It's gonna be very difficult to distinguish symptoms. Most people with no symptoms who are 40% again asymptomatic with this are still walking around spreading this. We have already seen when schools have opened up, colleges and other gatherings, that there are these super spreader events and that the numbers have sh made schools and classrooms have to shut down. You can look at all the data from other countries that didn't have the carnage that we have in this country from this because they have a culture of protecting each other. This is a public health issue. I'm delighted that you protected us as well as you did with the last meeting on this. Unfortunately, there's nowhere near enough enforcement as we see groups of people gathering with no masks everywhere. It's not just death rates you need to look at. We have people, and I know some, who have tremendous post-COVID hospital stays with enormous health issues going ongoing that will likely be for the rest of their lives. We need experts, not just random politics to decide this. And you can't just look at death rates. You have to assume that for every reported case, there are at least 10 times more walking around without masks spreading this. This is a crucial uh, case of needing to look at other countries' data and our own. And the only reason that I can see that we are lowering numbers, and the numbers aren't accurate anyway, are because we're doing as much as we're doing. We have to do more, not less, especially with schools reopening here, influenza coming to make this harder to distinguish, and no easy treatment or cures or herd immunity in sight. Even when a vaccine comes, many will not receive it and it's not gonna be 100%. This is not influenza. This is, and, and even that kills over 50,000 people. All the t I'm not sure of the numbers in the country. This is a, a mass death and disability event that's gonna be with us for generations. We need to do everything we can to stop more of this spread. The mask is the least of it. Dr. Levine, your time has expired, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Madam Chair, our next speaker is Diane Lebedev. Uh, Diane, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Diane Lebedev, L-E-B as in boy, E-D as in David, E-F-F as in Frank Frank, Safety Harbor. Thank you. I, I'm so glad I, I followed Dr. Levine because I would really underscore everything that she had to say. I'd like to compliment you on extending the mass mandate for one week last week to see what the data was going to be coming forward in relation to school openings. I think we've seen even in universities where the people should be old enough and sensible enough to be able to keep on a mask, unlike elementary schools, for example, that there have been explosions of rates of um, infection from COVID. And we really, I think, you have to take those into account, as well as almost every area, including Florida, if you remember the boasts of, of the governor from March, where the, where the COVID rate has gone down. It is common for it to explode. I, it's no time to stop being vigilant. I know people are complaining, I've said this before, I don't enjoy wearing a mask. I have COPD, I have World Trade Center exposure. I wear a mask. I wanna protect others. And to the extent that it protects me, I wanna protect myself. For protecting myself, the mask ordinance is the thing that protects me and other Pinellas citizens. Um, I'd just like to also mention, people have asked that you have some criteria. And as we can see from the numbers going up and the numbers going down, and this has happened all across the country, um, there is no way to predict what the future holds. As a matter of public policy, I would actually encourage you to just adopt the mask ordinance for the next month, and because that's the minimum of what we're gonna need. And the other thing is, finally, there was a comment that there was eye rolling by members of the commission. I must say, I've watched a number of these hearings and I would like to thank you all for your diligent listening and your fine display of proper conduct for a public servant. So thank you very much. And I, I yield my time as it were. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have eight remaining speakers that wish to be heard. Our next speaker is, I have a, I don't have a first name, last name, Mac. Uh, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your first name, last name, spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. My name is Susan Mack. I'm from North Reddington Beach. Um, on July 16th, I initially called in and asked the board what the determining factors were for keeping the mask mandate. For those of you keeping score, Commissioner Welch, that was seven weeks ago. I asked if there was any data involved in your decision. No one had an answer. In the following week's meetings, there were many, many members of our community that have called in and asked about the metrics. You have yet to answer these questions or provide the logic behind this. As Dave mentioned earlier, if there was a number that determined the cases to institute this mandate, there should be a number to determine to end it. Seems pretty simple, right? At some point we have to quit saying, let's see what happens after the 4th of July, after the first day of school, after Labor Day. Or is the big question, are we waiting to see what happens until after the election in November? One of the statements in the Pinellas County values is, we will provide an open and accountable government. I believe many of you on this board need to reread that statement. With that being said, as a reminder, you work for us. We don't work for you. We aren't your subjects. You need to repeal this mask mandate and let us get back to living our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, there are, six, there are six remaining speakers that wish to be heard. Our next speaker is Beth Weinstein. Uh, Beth, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. 
Yes, Beth Weinstein, W-E-I-N-S-T-E-I-N, 1012 Greenleaf Way, Tarpon Springs, Florida. First and foremost, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to hear our um, concerns. I believe that the mask mandate has worked. I am a resident of Pinellas. I have children who go to the school and my husband is also immunocompromised. The science is very clear and I see that many people on these calls have had a uh, or exhibiting a Dunning-Kroger effect. I don't believe that it should be politicized. At the end of the day, mask wearing does save lives. I don't understand why people are concerned about wearing a mask when our children have to go through active shooter drills in schools. <laughs> and realistically, we know that in countries where mask mandating was taken on early, that they are now opening their societies and opening their schools. And I think that there will be an economic disadvantage if we remove the mask mandate. I myself will no longer go to restaurants and other establishments without a mask mandate in place. I was not going out prior to the mask mandate. And I see overwhelmingly, if you look at um, polls and opinions of people, the majority of us want a continuing mask mandate. And without that, we do, will not feel safe leaving our homes with a virus that is airborne, that has no adequate treatment, we don't have effective rapid testing, and we have absolutely no tracing. And as other callers have uh, mentioned, flu season is soon to be upon us. So I don't understand why there is such a challenge with people wanting to protect others, both ourselves and those who are the most vulnerable in our community. And I hope that you keep the mask mandate in place. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Lucinda Johnson. Uh, Lucinda, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. My name is Lucinda Johnston. I reside at 348 11th Avenue Northeast in St. Petersburg, and I wear a mask. I appreciate the mask mandate. I want to speak to the people who have called in referring to people that are dying from this disease like they were collateral damage. My husband is 72 years old. He has five comorbidity factors, but he also works full time at the University of South Florida as a professor and serves on 41 doctoral committees. I believe he would be missed if he died from COVID-19 or anything else. To refer to anyone who catches this disease and passes away is, is just the cost of doing business is ridiculous. We've been on lockdown for 175 days today. We used to dream of going to Paris on vacation, and now we dream about going to El Caps and getting a hamburger, that that would just be the best thing we could ever do. And I did, I will apologize for rolling my eyes at the person who said that waiting until after the 4th of July was ridiculous, when after the 4th of July, two weeks later is when we saw that huge spike mid-July. So she sort of contradicted herself. And lastly, I would like to speak to the people who are politicizing this issue. And I would like to tell them the impact that they have on people who are supporting other candidates, uh, like Charlie Justice and Janet Long. We don't go on Facebook to campaign. We pick up the telephone and we make thousands of calls and we drop literature on doors. So if they think that they're going to be able to beat Charlie and Janet, they need to get off of Facebook and go out and start working for it because we're going to work to keep two people who believe in science on our county commission. Thank you. And I won't take any more of your time. Thank you. Madam Chair, there are still six hands in the air um, that wish to be heard. Our next speaker is Jeremy Reynolds. Uh, Mr. Reynolds, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Your name is Jeremy Reynolds, J-E-R-E-M-Y-R-E-Y-N-O-L-D-S, 973 Cedarwood Avenue. Quick shout out to Commissioner Eggers. Howdy. Um, four things to get. Guys, number one, thank you for removing the, the chat option on your Zoom. That was really annoying and, and was full of so much abhorrent spam it wasn't even funny. 
Uh, secondly, on the mask mandate, thank you for keeping the mask mandate in place. I would love to hear from Dr. Cho and Dr. Jameson just how many people have been hospitalized and how many fatalities we've seen from people wearing masks, and I think it'll speak for itself. Secondly, secondly on, on the purchase of the Hackworth property, um, you know, please hold your, your county administrator to account for moving forward on this. Um, you know, it's very difficult uh, when you're a, a participatory municipality in Pinellas County to be able to get the county to work fast enough to, to make things happen. And you've got a very unique um, opportunity to, to be able to, to capture and preserve an ecological jewel here. Last but not least, one of the previous speakers spoke about the uh, arbitrary three minute time limit on public input. I understand that is a very common uh, practice throughout Pinellas County. So I would like to know that, you know, I know a lot of that reasonable threshold stems from a Jones v. Heyman case out of 1989. And what I would like to know is when you look at Florida statute 286.0114 subsection four, that was passed in 2013, it allows the commission to set rules around its procedurals and time limits, but that would still have to satisfy the other clause of that same statute that says that the public must be afforded a reasonable opportunity to be, to be heard. So my question is how can an arbitrary three minute limit satisfy a purposefully ambiguous standard of reasonableness. That's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is coming in on the telephone line, last four digits, 7233. If you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your first, last name, spelling, and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. And 7233, you'll have to unmute your line. Hello? Madam Chair, we'll try to go back to 7233 in a minute here. I'm gonna to go to the next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Sharon Herman. Uh, Sharon, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, thank you. This is Sharon Herman, S-H-A-R-O-N-H-E-R-M-A-N. 2325 Armor Drive in Dunedin, Florida. And uh, just want to say thank you for all your hard work. And I wanted to um, just pipe in and agree with Dr. Levine and everything that she said. Uh, we still don't have a cure for COVID obviously. And right now we still need to utilize whatever means that we have to try and control this. Uh, masks are <laughs> one of the big things that we can do, especially since school has started and we have increased contact amongst people. This is not the time to take your foot off the pedal of the gas. We need to do everything that we can. And uh, flu season is upon us. Uh, you know, we're just going to have people with more compromised immune systems. Uh, if folks get the flu, they're going to be weaker if they're recovering from that. We still have COVID out there. So, uh, you know, with over 180,000 people dead, I don't think this is a time to just start running around with a holiday weekend and not wear your mask. And that's all. <coughs> Excuse me. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Carla Rudolph. Uh, Ms. Rudolph, if you go ahead and mute yourself, give, me, give us your spelling and address for the record. You'll have three minutes to address the board. Yes, Carla Rudolph. I live in St. Petersburg. Um, Thank you. I, you know, I called in last week. I do have an issue with wearing a mask, and I feel, you know, I feel for the people who 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 want to wear the mask, and that's okay. But there are those who either they choose not to, or they have an issue with wearing a mask. And so I'm just going to reiterate what I said last week: make it optional. If people want to trust in the mask, let them trust in the mask. But for those of us who have an issue with it, or those who choose not to, make it an optional thing. There's so much going on. And I think that there's, there's, I mean, there's just so much lies and deception, I think all over the place, just flying around. Nobody knows what the truth is anymore, tell you the truth. Um, there are doctors saying, oh, you gotta wear the mask. And then there's doctors saying that the masks don't do any good. Um, pick your side, which you wanna you know, trust in the mask or not, but you know, to force everybody to do the same thing, um, it does not make sense. There's a lot of this that just does not make sense. You see numbers on both sides and it's hard, it's hard for one side to convince the other side of what's going on because in reality, I'm not sure if any of us know the whole truth. Make it optional, please. Thank you. Thank you. 
Madam Chair, our next speaker is Katie Green. Uh, Katie, if you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Yes, thank you. Um, Katie Green, and I live at 335 Buena Vista Drive South here in Dunedin. And um, I'm calling because I really think it's important to keep this a public health issue. This has become a, a political issue uh, and is used by um, uh, politicians to keep us divided, to keep us confused, because as long as people are confused, they are much easier to control. Um, I believe we should uh, follow the scientists, believe the scientists, look what other countries have been doing, and um, just you know, be aware of how many schools have tried to open and have had to shut down. Um, this is, uh, it's really need to keep the mask thing going. Um, I went through Dunedin the other day and downtown you'd think that COVID was completely over with the number of people waiting to get into pubs. And um, it, I really think that staying masked and being healthy is more important than um, uh, letting, you know, letting it just be relaxed. Thank you. Madam Chair, our next speaker is Tommy Frain. Uh, Mr. Frain, if we go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Here, Tommy, T-O-M-M-Y, Frain, F-R-A-I-N, 1671 Autumnwood Street, Tarpon Springs, Florida. I'll be very quick. Um, obviously, fully support uh, continuing the mask mandate. Um, the previous speaker a couple ago um, spoke about not knowing what the truth is. You can find an opinion, you can find support for an, any kind of opinion on the internet if you'd like. Uh, what you described was confirmation bias. <laughs> um, we should not be looking for support for a certain opinion. You should be looking at evidence and then coming up with an opinion after that. So uh, I just wanted to reiterate that um, this is a scientific issue. Um, you know, I, I rely very heavily on my parents and my in-laws to allow me and my wife to support our three children to work. Um, if I felt it's not safe, um, I don't know what I would do. I would have to have all my kids here. My wife may have to quit her job. Um, so I think we need to maintain the thought of public health and public safety and not, uh, you know, not relinquish too soon now that we see some of the numbers are coming down. Um, so thanks so much for your time. And also just wanted to say black lives still matter. We're still marching out every day. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have two speakers remaining that wish to be heard. Both of them are on the phone lines, the ones that we tried before. I'm going to try one more time here. Um, last four digits, 1419. If you'll go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your first last name, spelling, and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. And if you're calling in on 1419, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Hello? And Madam Chair, it appears they're having difficulty on, on their side. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to last four digits, 7233. If you can go ahead and try to unmute and give us your first, last name, spelling, and address, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hello? Hello. Hello. Hi, my name is Joellen Murphy. I'm calling from Dunedin, Florida. I am a first-line um, worker. I work for the bus company here in Dunedin, and I feel everyone should wear a mask. It doesn't matter who your politician is, what kind of side of the rope you're on. It doesn't matter. Everyone must wear a mask. I put my life on the line every day. I have illnesses that I should not be working, but I have to go to work to support my family. And the only thing we're asking is for you to put a mask on. It's not a lot. I live right up the street from downtown Dunedin, and I watch every day all these people walking around with no mask. They all need to put a mask on. It's not going to hurt you. It's to save lives. I just lost a 26-year-old daughter because of this. Is that okay? Because people can't put a mask on? We're not asking for much. Put a mask on. And I think this mandatory mask should stay in effect until we can get this better. And if it takes a year, well, then you have to wear a mask for a year. 
get over it. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate everything you guys do. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. Madam Chair, we have one remaining speaker, uh, Liz Dreyer. Liz, if you go ahead and unmute yourself and give us your spelling and address for the record, you'll have three minutes to address the board. Hi, I'm Liz Dreyer, D-R-A-Y-E-R. Uh, I live in Clearwater, 3175 Hyde Park Drive. I want to endorse the comments of Dr. Elena Levine, who summed up very neatly why we need to continue this mask mandate. The number one priority should be protection of public health. Please make that your priority and continue the mask mandate. And with respect to the Douglas property, I'm hugely disappointed the county did not acquire that when it had the opportunity. I hope that to the extent possible, now that the property is under contract, you pull out all the stops and do everything possible to get a hold of that property. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And hey, Madam Chair, there are no other new citizens that wish to be heard. Okay, well, we will close public comment then. Um, let's have an update on where we are. For the um, state of emergency? Yes. Okay. Um, so we are asking uh, that you extend the order from September 4th to September 11th. There's been a lot of discussion, obviously, about the numbers you've heard from uh, Dr. Cho, Dr. Jameson. We also have Dr. Thog Martin on the line uh, to answer any questions specifically to concerns that are raised. We, we are seeing better numbers. We saw better numbers in May, uh, right before we saw a spike um, that consumed us all summer for that to get under control. We have 70,000 students and teachers going back to school. It will take time to see the impact of that. Um, Dr. Greco supports us continuing the mask mandate um, until we have a better and clearer picture of what's occurring within the community. Uh, this is, in my opinion, and I'm sure with our doctors will confirm, um, a minimum step that we can do that does help prevent the spread uh, within the community. So we are asking for that extension and uh, happy to, uh, to answer any questions or you can ask any of the doctors on the line any specific questions. Thank you. Yeah, actually I asked for Dr. Thogmorton to be here just to respond to the, um, what was in the national news about the CDC and the uh, cause of death. Um, right. What does it really mean when they say that only 6% had a single cause of death of COVID-19. What Does that change anything about what we're doing? Great question. Well, um, all I'd say is um, this is not unexpected. Uh, I don't know, maybe they should have put an editorial comment in about that. Um, COVID um, does not really kill healthy people. It will, but not typically. So when I saw that data, I was going, okay, yeah, 6% of COVID-19 cases are COVID alone. We've seen about that number. I can totally, I can totally believe it. But what I think people need to wrap their mind around this, what percentage of people in Pinellas, Pasco, Florida, United States, <clears throat> what percentage of people that just live every day with a chronic illness that would put them at risk? And I don't think people understand that. So it comes up where you have a cause of death, but you also have contributory conditions. And if you're above the age of 40, you may have a case of hypertension. You may have the middle age spread. You may have such a middle age spread that you're now pushing into the realm of type two diabetes. And then you get a little hypertension to go along with that. And then you have your first cardiac stent. Let's throw in a little cigarette smoking. You, you're 40, you've been a cigarette smoker for 20 years. All these things add up. It's kind of like, uh, I was trying to explain this to a lawyer friend of mine and I explained it this way. Having COVID is like swimming in deep water. If you're a good swimmer, you're young and healthy, you'll be fine. But let's throw something in there. I see people drown and they're swimming in deep water. Let's throw in alcohol intoxication. So a normal person that swims in deep water is a good swimmer, won't drown. They're in no danger really. Uh, but you give them an alcohol level of 0.3 grams percent and suddenly you've got a drowning. So alcohol would be a contributor. Having COVID-19 is kind of like swimming in deep water. 
you're 25 years old, you're a good swimmer, it's going to make your pulse rate go up. It'll make you maybe short of breath with the effort and you'll be able to do it for a while. Um, but let's add in, uh, let's say you're deconditioned. You're a 25 year old that's in very poor physical condition or you're heavy, or let's make you 40 years old and you've got smoking in your history for 20 years. Let's make you 60 years old and you've got atrial fibrillation, hypertension, and you've had a stent in one of your coronary arteries. Now you're swimming. The water gets more and more dangerous as we add age and as we add comorbidities. If you took any average 99, 100 year old person and you put them in water above their heads and told them to swim, they wouldn't make it. It's the same thing with COVID. Maybe not so great, but most of our cases that I see, and I've been certifying most of them, have significant comorbidities. About anywhere between 40 to 60% of the American population has a chronic illness. 12, I've seen numbers of 12% have five or more. I would bet that Pinellas County with our average age, I'll bet you it's close to 20% of people have five or more chronic conditions. So yes, yes, COVID is not a danger to you if you have a clean health record. Generally, it won't be unless you're unlucky, just like swimming in deep water. You may get a cramp and drown, but it's unlikely. But if you have medical conditions and you're forced to go through this, it can really hurt you and kill you. Our numbers totally reflect what the CDC is putting out, but it, you can't write off people with chronic health conditions. And it, it's more, it's the chronic health, they're thinking it's really, really bad health conditions. No, if you're on an antihypertensive med and your body mass index, let's say is 30, I wouldn't want to get COVID, stuff like that. Thank you. That's very good. I, <laughs> that's exactly I, what I, I wanted to know. Share, Thank I can you. share one other thing though. Um, our numbers, as far as deaths go, seem to have peaked. We had uh, end of July, early August, uh, our total <coughs> district was 125. That was our total number of deaths during that week. 94 for Pinellas. We came down, I'll just give you the Pinellas numbers. It went to 58 the next week, 48, 44. And now the last week that we have a complete week and assuming all the cases that have been reported have been reported, we are at 22. And that's from starting from, you know, zero at the end of March. It just kind of ramped up and then it kind of disappeared a little bit with the lockdown. And then when we opened up again, you end up with, it coincided with the delay to our peak at the end of July. But definitely we felt the relief lately with the deaths. Well, thank goodness, thank you. Um, questions? Yes, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> As I sat here this morning and listened to some of the folks that were calling in, it brought me back to the days when I used to be on the debate club in college. And that idea made me wonder, and I'm throwing this out there for just discussion with my colleagues to see what you might think. I reached out to um, Dr. Feynman, the chief medical officer for HCA <laughs> Hospital, you may remember he has spoken to us a couple of times. And I asked him if he could find out through their very large organization, if there were any board certified physician who specialized in infectious disease that did not believe that masks and social distancing, et cetera, et cetera, were the answers to getting this thing under control, just so that we could perhaps hear from that person, as so many people have suggested that we're just listening to fake science and fake news. Um, I, I'd like to just see if any of the rest of you have any interest in that because I remember when we were going through the fluoride issue, which a lot of this reminds me of in the way in which people are forming their messaging and talking to us. I do remember hearing from a physician who had an opposing view. And as a result of that conversation we had with him, 
it caused us to be firmly rooted in the decisions we were about to make. So I just say that not to cause another kerfuffle, but just as an idea. So thank you for letting me share that. Mr. Eggers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, to, to Commissioner Long's point um, and what we've been talking about the last few weeks is we need to be continuing to have dialogue. Um, you know, you, you, we each are doing our own research. We're each doing our own reading. We're listening to the doctors. We're listening to other doctors. Uh, to the extent that we can bring a doctor in with a count point, counterpoint, I have no problem with that. I, I think it, it's incumbent upon us to hear from folks because uh, we ultimately are making those decisions. And so, um, I, you know, again, th there will be a point in time when those masks, that mask ordinance comes out off the board, so to speak. Um, and th the efforts, again, that we're making now and after that action is taken at some point in the future aren't gonna change. And then if the numbers get bad again, we may, the mask may go back on again and the effort will not change. We continue to do the research. We continue to try to understand what's going on out there. We're continuing to try to listen to the science. We're continuing to try to listen to our residents, the ones that called in with passion today. I respect them greatly. There's others that didn't call in with the opposing views. Uh, some of them did call in as well. So I, I think this is an ongoing effort. I do like some of the comments that have been made over the last eight weeks that we've been hearing from people that maybe we should be taking this opportunity from our doctors to, to address wellness and nutrition as a you know, kind of a parallel effort. Talk about the things that we can be doing from an exercise standpoint, eating better, maybe, and, and we've all heard it before, but just bring it back into context because clearly that's, that's an issue that we can all benefit from. And if this is a time when people can reflect a little bit more, maybe one or two more people or two percentage of people get out and exercise more or eat a little better and maybe eat better this week, not so good next week, but at least have it in the back of their minds, things that we can do to bring, to bring this to our attention, um, I think is good. And um, um, so it, that really is all I had to say. I mean, I, you know, this is, this issue, it continues to have a lot of dialogue. Um, I did uh, like what I heard a couple people say this morning. Uh, I like what everybody was saying, just to hear from different folks, but the part about, trying to get back to work, needing support from their families to, to take care of kids that may not be oh, in school nice. age yet and having to get back to work and wanting to be as safe as possible. So when they came home, they're not exposing their parents or their grandparents or whoever's taking care of their kids. This is a, you know, again, you know, the uh, we're all in this together thing that people are critiquing that statement, but it's true. We're all kind of having to work our way through this thing. And the sooner that we can get back to normal, I can tell you it will be a unanimous vote. Everybody wants back to normal. Whenever that happens, uh, we'll be right there with everybody trying to do that. But um, I, um, I certainly support the, the keeping the, the, the status quo right now, continuing to reflect on our own criteria for, the, for, for changing our positions, listening to our doctors, and also starting to think a little bit about, I know it's always one event to the next. It was July 4th, now it's Labor Day, it's the school opening. There is growing concern. I was I sit on the Bay Bay Pines uh, board or uh, uh, um, it's a value adjustment board. It's a value board, not a value adjustment board. A value board uh, from the resident standpoint, and um, they're talking about coming up with a. They have a piece of equipment that they're testing now that will be able to tell the difference between flu and and COVID and other infectious diseases with one test. And so that's coming. Um, uh, they're not ready for that yet. Some of our hospitals were looking and trying to find out if they, if they have that, that, that ability as well. So um, again, a lot going on. I think people need to think long and hard about the flu shot this year so we can kind of try to rule out that piece while we still work our way through this COVID thing. Um, and a lot of people uh, maybe, maybe step that effort up and maybe step that messaging up. Uh, thank you for letting me ramble. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I agree with um, much of what uh, Commissioner Egger said, and, and I think the path back to normalcy involves maintaining what we're doing now. I mean, the reason that we implemented the mass was to get the trends down so that we wouldn't have to go back to 
uh, a shutdown. So this is the way we keep our economy open by doing the things we need to do. I just want to comment on a couple of things that were said just for the record. Uh, Ms. Bowler made the comment that I stated that my vote was based on the number of calls, and that's absolutely not true. Um, I'd simply noted the, the number of calls that came in, and um, of course, that's non-scientific in a county of almost a million people. Um, 20 people calling in or 100 emails is not scientific. We want the input, but at the end of the day, that's not what we base our decision on, just the people who happened to call in that day. And for the record, since uh, my friends note that I'm keeping record, there were 13 calls in favor of maintaining the mask ordinance today and 10 against. Again, non-scientific, that's just the folks who happen to call in. I, I wanted to, again, uh, we're relying on the science. We're not, it is sad that this has become politicized, but this commission has not made this political. We've listened to the science and the healthcare professionals from day one. And again, I want to thank Dr. Cho and Dr. James for the job they do uh, and the advice they give us. But let's just, you know, there's a scripture that says you, a prophet's never known in their hometown. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Jameson and Cho, we're going to pull you out for a minute. Let's just go to, to the CDC and see what they're saying. Uh, I don't know, Brian, if you can pull that up. But this is on the CDC website right now as we speak. If, if Brian can pull up that first bullet. For my 56-year-old uh, eyes, I'll, I'll look over to the side. The first bullet, this is the CDC recommendation. The CDC recommends that people wear masks in public settings and when around people who don't live in your household, especially when other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. Thank you, Brian. That's word for word what our ordinance says. Um, and so this is from the top, from the CDC, and then from all of our healthcare professionals, um, five CEOs we've heard from uh, of local hospitals, healthcare professionals say, this is important. This is a science that works. This is why our numbers are trending uh, in the right fashion. And so I, I uh, like Commissioner Eggers, support the status quo uh, at this time. This is how we live with COVID. Uh, until we have a vaccine. And so, um, again, it's a success story for our county. Uh, let's not make it political to the folks who just have a, a, a passionate disagreement. Just know that on certain issues, we're going to disagree on the facts. And in my case, I'm going to vote with uh, the healthcare professionals from the CDC on down who say masks work. And until there's a vaccine, that's one of the ways that we can combat the spread of COVID. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Commissioner Peters. Yes, Madam Chair, I have a question and then some comments, please. Okay. Um, and, and this is a question for any of the doctors on their own because someone has asked me to ask it and I probably would have asked it anyways. Um, how many people live with comorbidities that would also succumb to the flu? Any other doctors want to answer that? And I know we have a significant death rate every year on the flu. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the, the mortality rates as it pertains to the flu, Commissioner Peters? Yeah, well, if, if they're living with comorbidity, com comorbidities. So let's say we have someone with two comorbidities and they get the flu, what's the, you know, the, what's that rate? Oh, uh, for really even beyond the flu, and generally uh, anyone with um, underlying health conditions, there are, are higher risk for a number of infectious diseases, whether it's the flu, whether it's other respiratory infections, whether it's even other bacterial infections, just naturally. And it's certainly uh, through Florida parts, we can track some of the chronic disease. And if you'd like to get some prevalence numbers, I can provide that to you. Um, in terms of the poor outcomes. Um, and, and I don't know if Dr. Doc Martin's on. I think some of the confusion um, people had with that particular article um, was that uh, they, uh, having filled out a number of, of uh, death certificates, having uh, being the local register for the death certificates here, um, I think there's a misunderstanding as to the causes of these treatment factors. Just because you don't you have these treatment factors, you don't it's not necessarily if they pass away from these contributing chronic comorbid conditions. Um, it's it's something like the COVID that sort of picked it over. The problem I had with some of the, the information that was out there 
with some background noise. Uh, some of the uh, the information that was out there, then you could use the same logic for example, cancer deaths or AIDS deaths, um, that you don't really die of AIDS in itself. You die of an opportunistic infection, you die of, of cancers related to it, or even for cancers, you die of respiratory failure or, or uh, overwhelming sepsis because you're immunocompromised. And I, I think that was a little bit of the confusion of, of that article. Um, and in general, um, Back to your point, uh, people with chronic conditions are unfortunately at higher risk for a number of infections. Commissioner Peters, just so you know, I muted you. Uh, so when you want to speak, go ahead and unmute yourself because we're getting some feedback coming from your device. I'm sorry about that. Okay, I'm not sure why, but okay. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Choi, I appreciate it. And, and uh, the person that sent the question in, um, I hope that answered your question. Um, I've got lots of thoughts on this, but um, first from the callers that talk about science, I mean, I brought this up many times before, and and, I'll, and I'm going to reiterate it again because there's a lots of science. There's a lot of science. So depending on which science you're going to read, but even if you look at CDC and if you look at OSHA, it does state that if your mask is wet, it is a danger to you. And I don't think we publicly even acknowledge that. I know Commissioner Long said that we should be doing um, PSAs about that because it is dangerous and it has, can cause other respiratory illnesses. Um, OSHA and the CDC website also say that yes, you can have an overabundance of carbon monoxide if you wear a mask. So the callers that call in are being discredited because they're quoting science and they're saying that they're not reading science when in fact they really are reading science and I'm certain that OSHA and the CDC have good science when they make those claims that yes, these things can happen when you wear a mask. So, so I, I do take offense when people assume that people that say that these things are real are dismissed saying it isn't science. It is in fact science. Um, and so I, I think we also need to do a better job about letting people know that if you start to get a headache, because you can get a headache um, from wearing a mask if it doesn't have good airflow. Um, I, you know, I think we need to do a better I, you know, talking points about yes, this stuff can happen. And yes, you need to wash your mask every day and you shouldn't wear a wet mask or you can get sick or if you work in a restaurant or someplace outside and you sweat, you need to change that mask. I, I don't wanna discredit the science there, that's real science and it's good science. Um, I think there's a lot coming out about this virus and we really aren't talking about, there's a couple articles and if you're really digging and reading, I think you know. So when this virus first appeared, we thought it was respiratory and now we're finding out it's vascular. Um, it is a real, serious virus and if anyone thinks it's not then they're mi really <laughs> misguided on that decision this is a very serious virus and anyone that's had it knows how dangerous it can be and how severe it can be whether you have a moderate a mild case or a severe case um, but i think what's really good is based on science is what we're doing to treat so when the first wave came we were treating with ventilators and we've now learned that ventilators are not the best action in which to treat people that have serious cases and so I think the more, when we have doctors on here, I think the more that they talk about what it is um, and that sticky blood is a real deal and it really is more of a vascular disease than a respiratory disease, um, I think the more people know and understand the disease and everything we've learned about it, because we don't talk about what we've learned. We don't talk about now that we're treating and that we have, um, <laughs> instead of ventilators, we have to use ECMO machines and, and clean blood and stuff like that. We don't, we don't really talk about it so people understand the virus and how serious it is. And so, so people who haven't experienced or haven't had loved ones that have really experienced may not really understand and know what people are going through when they get it. Um, but I do believe all that said, I do believe that there is fatigue. I think the community has a lot of fatigue and I think the community wants to know that there's an end in sight. And I've asked two weeks in a row, maybe three weeks in a row, our citizens have asked, many times just to give them some kind of criteria so they know. And I don't think it's too much to ask for us to publicly state what that criteria is, but for some reason this commission doesn't want to go there. They don't want to make a commitment to it. I know Barry said on the phone that maybe it's time we start talking about it, but I think it's time we start talking about it and we start talking about it publicly with transparency so that people understand and they know that there's some deadline, some end in sight. Now we've gone three weeks with very low numbers, and, and you all might say, oh, and we'll give it a month. Well, is it a month from the three weeks it started or is it a month from now? 
it, or a month from when you finally come up with a decision if you pick a month. But I think that if we go another two weeks with two numbers, I think we give people a break. I think we don't right now, this emergency order, we're not getting federal funds right now. We don't need federal funds right now. What are we getting reimbursements for in the last three weeks when our numbers were down? We don't really necessarily need it. Now, when we spike again, we're gonna need it. Is there gonna be a spike? I believe there's gonna be another spike. But do we give people a break or do we at least give them a deadline? Do we need this emergency action right now or do we need it in a week or two or three weeks? and let people have some kind of rest or some kind of anything, or just, just let them know. You wanna keep the mask in place, that's fine. Keep the mask in place, but give them a deadline. Give them some kind of criteria. So at least they've got something to hang on to because right now they've got fatigue and fear and there's nothing for them to hang on to. And I don't think that it's gonna hurt us too much to give them some kind of criteria. I think we've, I think we've done a disservice to the citizens not giving them some kind of end date or end criteria so that they know I think it's unfair and I think we should do it. Um, what we do know is 19, more than 19,000 people have had this disease, so we know that 19,000 people have the antibodies. We also know that a large population has the, the T cells, which is the memory cell from any other COVID, whether it's the common cold or anything else. They have memory cells called T cells, which I think I'm the only one that's really talked about those and Dr. Cho confirmed them, which also serve as an antibody to protect any of us. So, so we don't know how far away we are from herd immunity based on T cells. And, and so, yes, there's people out there reading science that people are being dismissive about the science they're reading. Um, and I think that the least we could do is first up acknowledge that we do need to clean our masks. And yes, if you have a headache, we need to get some more oxygen so the headache goes away if you're wearing a mask. And I also believe that we need to give them an end date. Those are my comments. I hope that you all agree and that we'll push harder on making sure that we have some criteria to let our citizens know what it is. Thank you. Um, I think it's a great idea to do more education or some education about proper use of masks and, you know, going forward. Um, I'm not sure who would do that. Commissioners, we have put that out through um, our communications department and we can continue and we'll continue to push um, that information out about cleaning the mask, right. if the mask is wet and those, those various things. They're well aware of that and they've tried to do that obviously, but information, you know, it's hard to get out sometimes, but yes, they continue to push that. Okay, thank you. The, the only other thing I did want to clarify is we do like running our testing sites and people that, that are involved in our emergency operations, buying of PPE, et cetera, and stuff. Those are all FEMA um, eligible reimbursable expenses. Um, so the emergency orders allows us to pl apply for FEMA. That's separate from the mask issue, but I just wanted to clarify the purpose of the emergency order there are reimbursables that we um, we will, depending upon how the CARES Act uh, money uh, is spent, we may in fact seek FEMA reimbursement for eligible expenses, and we're tracking those. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Long. Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I would just for a moment uh, like to address a few of the comments that Commissioner Peters has made, especially since so many of the citizens calling in today and in the past meetings we've been in have alluded to it as well. But they seem to think that we don't have a plan and that we're not having our leadership discussions to give our population an idea of when we will be done with all of this. And, and I just would like to, and this is just me as an individual, I mean, we're elected officials here. We're not magicians. Everyone that has talked about this virus has recognized and acknowledged that it's new, it's evolving. We're learning more about it almost on a daily basis. And so to be able to predict how it's going to end is something that is just humanly impossible right now. And I think that what we're really worried about, at least I am, is that we make a horrific mistake and that we go back to life as we used to know it before we're really ready. We have examples all over the country of communities and states and even countries who have done that. And it has been an enormous life altering mistake. And so the, the way in which we're Progressing and moving forward is to be thoughtful and to be um, 
knowledgeable and to make the very best decisions that we possibly and humanly can. So it's painful. I, I mean, I think we all struggle deeply with these decisions and how it's affecting our citizen and our children and our grandkids and our small businesses. And the one thing I really want to stress, Commissioner Welch mentioned it, is we don't want to make a mistake that forces us to shut down the whole community again. That would be catastrophic. So what our focus should be is on how do we assist and help going forward to ensure that we do not have to do that. And I, we haven't had a discussion about some of the problems that our young parents face with having to go back to work and not having proper uh, cost-effective childcare where they can know that their children are safe and maybe moving on forward, we could have a conversation about that so that if there's a way through the different grants that we receive or that we are putting out into the community to help our citizens, I think that would be a good conversation to have as well. Thank you. Thank you. We are funding child care centers with our CARES Act money. Um, Commissioner Eggers? Commissioner Eggers, you're muted, sir. Thank you. Of course. Um, now, just, uh, you know, we listen to folks every week and we've lis been listening to our conversation here. And, um, you know, I do think we have an opportunity at these meetings. We're meeting every week. Uh, sometimes it's commission meetings and sometimes it's we're getting together to extend um, the emergency order that we have an opportunity to talk about the upcoming flu season and what we can do about it. We have we can talk about uh, mask uh, issues that come up. I think Commissioner Peter spoke to that. I think we can talk about that. We can have a, you know, for for lack of a better thing, you know, you know, call it a, 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 a nutrition or a helpful corner that we bring up every meeting. We can talk about nutrition. We can talk about exercise. We can talk about the value of those things to our residents. We can talk about the getting back to work piece, which is so critically important. People, I'm not sure what the unemployment numbers are this week, but you know, obviously it got very high, coming down slightly along the way. But we've got you know getting people back to work. So trying to make sure that we're all doing what we can so we can continue that march forward. I think we're in phase two right now of the of the governor's uh, position. I mean, we're not in phase three yet. So mm -hmm. But I think we can start to do some of that at every meeting and instead of, and be a, a kind of that proactive thing. What, what concerns me a little bit, and I, and I, you know, is that, you know, it's like everything, you know, I'm hearing revolves around whether you have the right to wear a mask or if you have, you don't want to wear a mask. And it's like, there's so much else going on in this whole equation, this whole discussion about, uh, about uh, where we are and what what our economic issues are, what our health issues are, what are what's coming, what and so you know that's what I was trying to say earlier. If we took the mask order off tomorrow, nothing changes. We're still at it uh, full time, trying to get a handle on this and trying to give folks uh, more information about doing things in a in a more healthy way. Um, and so. Yeah, there's fatigue. It's probably some people from masks, but it's just the whole process is fatiguing. Not being able to be social with each other is fatiguing. Our kids not being able to be social is fatiguing. Um, but let's let's point to things that we can do to help minimize or try to improve on that fatigue issue. And 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 it's not just about masks. I mean, let, we can say it is. Some people are very passionate about that. I get it. Uh, but there's so much more to this. And, and I think we as a, as a uh, I know we're putting some of that information out, Barry, on, on, the, on the website. But I think us having that discussion or our experts coming on board and talking a little bit about at each of these meetings, it doesn't have to be an hour or two, it just can be a little 15 minute segment on, on anything, speaks, I think, even stronger. So um, anyway, I'm sorry, probably some of the same things that I said a minute ago, but I wanted to emphasize the part. I think Commissioner Peters touched on a couple of things about how do we how do we do this better together? How do we educate? How do we do things in a little bit better manner? So I'd like to encourage uh, Barry to try to develop that each week, some other thing that we can uh, learn about. So thank you. 
Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think it's a great idea to have something particularly about flu season coming up and heaven knows you don't want to have both these things at the same time. Um, Commissioner Gerard. Yes, please. Oh, okay, uh, so thank you for bringing up the flu shot. I was gonna actually mention it uh, as well. I, I think in this year more than any other year, I think the flu shot, getting the flu shot is, is the utmost importance. Uh, I know nationally and locally, we don't do a great job with the flu shots, uh, the uptake of the flu shots. In adults nationally, it's less than 50%, and I think we're lower here even more so. Um, and keep in mind that a lot of the same symptoms of COVID um, is very similar to that of the flu. And if you have going to institutions, if you're going to schools that do these symptom screenings, it can cause a lot of disruption since they do share those common symptoms. So I do encourage everyone to get their flu shot this year. Uh, they are available. You can get them anywhere in the stores, um, in, in your doctor's offices, CVS, Publix, et cetera. And when, is, when does flu season actually start? I mean, are we in it now? Uh, we, we generally, a little bit later um, is more the height, um, October to uh, early spring. Uh, we do generally see peaks here in Pinellas County uh, about uh, late January, early February, or late January more so. Okay, thank you. Uh, one final question. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, just Barry, um, we were we were going to try to get a, a, a we, I think we got the information on the counties that have uh, implemented a mask ordinance and, yeah. and, and, and so uh, maybe we can bring forward at the next meeting um, like some of the counties that are not doing a mask ordinance, kind of what their numbers are, kind of what they're what they're seeing their challenges being. I think again, you know, we don't have to be that test ground. We can look to our neighbors. I think the neighbors around us all have mask ordinances, but there, I know that there's a lot of counties, or maybe one or two, that are similar to ours that don't have it. And just trying to get a sense of where they are and what how they're dealing with it and the challenges that they have. You asked Thank for that before. We are going to be doing some research on that. Um, you know, and for the public, there's 21 mandatory mask ordinances in effect, um, and that includes virtually all, you know, with just a couple of exceptions, um, the urban counties. Um, and this that uh, that does include Pasco, um, Hillsborough, Manatee. Um, so you know, all of the neighboring counties it, 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 um, have a mask ordinance. But we will be doing research and bringing that back to you. Thank you. And we are by far the most densely populated county in the state. So just saying. Um, anything else? We need to um, look at this ordinance then. We'll entertain a motion. I move approval. Second. And we have a motion from Commissioner Seal, second from Commissioner Welch. All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Status report on the project to improve the development services system. And Barry, after you do that, could we hear about the Douglas property again and where we well, are? Well, I can do that first and we can okay. get in because right. you probably got callers on the line that would like to hear about that. <clears throat> so, you know, obviously you heard from the Dunedin City Commission um, had a discussion regarding that and asked staff to work. We're actually uh, meeting with them uh, tomorrow again, uh, the city staff to to review the property. So to give a little bit of history, we've been talking with the uh, state for some time, and yes, there were some deadlines and things that were put out. But I will tell you this: the issue comes down to we do not have the funds to go out every time somebody um, offers a property sale at a commercial value and buy it. Um, so we were looking for a way in which to come up with something that is both affordable um, and then that would preserve property. That's where we were working in the spring uh, with the um, city. We also had to look to see if the forever funds out of the state uh, were gonna be renewed. And in fact, if those funds would be available, but I will tell you, there's only $10 million for the entire state. So, you know, it, it, from a matching funds, there are limited pots of money and we can go through that and have you know, Paul Kazi explained that. Uh, we are very, very familiar with all the granting sources at both a, a state and a federal level. Um, but we're gonna work, um, we've, we've made our intentions known to the estate, we did before, that we, uh, we wanna work with them if there's an opportunity to do that. I've also been told um, that the, um, the developer or the, um, the representative of the developer is gonna be contacting me, if that's the case. I'll express our intent. However, 
um, there's limitations that can occur when you have a contract for sale. And there are um, legal, legal issues there uh, regarding what we can and cannot do. So we're gonna make sure that we work with our county attorney's office um, to comply with that, um, those limitations, but we are gonna work with the city and um, continue to have conversations with the estate uh, to in fact, if there's an opportunity uh, to put something together, um, then we will, we will act on that. So um, there's gonna be more to come, but I will tell you, this is going to take time. Uh, the, the, that 60 day window doesn't end until the end of October, middle end of October, somewhere around there. So that, that will take time. Um, but rest assured, we are meeting. We're going to be discussing with all parties involved um, to see if there's an opportunity and there's something that we can do that is affordable within our budgetary constraints, uh, then we would uh, bring that forward for, uh, for you as a recommendation. And I will continue to keep you updated on our one-on-ones, um, but there, you know, it's gonna, it, this, it, this will take time. And uh, uh, so more to come, but that's a, a brief update. Thank you, Commissioner Peters. I probably shouldn't have bring this up, but uh, I might regret it later. But, um, you know, just like they want to save that land, what about tides? Is that something that we would even consider with the tides? Because South County doesn't have a one for two acre lot, anything. Uh, South County doesn't have a lot of natural preserves. So, um, I, you know, it's just as long as you're throwing that one out, there's a lot more to throw out, but we get a lot of communications on tides and I don't even know that that's an option. I will there be isn't like a private owner that's giving you that option, but as long as we're getting a lot of emails on it. The tides is not for sale. Um, and so there's nothing to act on. I will be communicating with you in the future regarding the status of the tides. Um, and um, I, wanna, I wanna get with um, our staff we did have some just recent communication, but I will be getting with you on that. But that's that's a good example, though, where um, the residents in that area want. I've been here less than two years, two years next month. I have had four um, inquiries where the residents in a certain area wanted us to purchase that property. That would have exceeded our entire 10 year period of uh, funding uh, for those properties. And so I understand that passion. I do. Um, so we have to be very judicious and, and we have to analyze options and alternatives as these come about. Um, we analyzed 60 different ideas of how to use those funds. Somebody said that there's no property for sale. I will tell you that there are um, either for sale or maybe would be um, for sale if something occurred. Maybe they're not for sale today, but they might be five or six years down the road. And we have to have funding available if those opportunities present themselves. We have areas where our residents have no recreation opportunities in the immediate area, or they have no preservation areas in the immediate area, but yet there may be an opportunity. So that's the balancing act that, you know, that we have to go through and analyzing each time there's an opportunity. Um, and we, um, we have to, uh, try to put some objective criteria in doing that. Um, but we are dealing with a limited amount of funding and that's the reason it's critical. Um, this is a great piece of property. It, it did rank um, high for environmental. It ranked really low for cost effectiveness. And that has to be a criteria that we incorporate. Um, it also ranked really low when you apply it between the recreation and the environmental. It actually ranked, I think, number 10th and 12th um, you know, in terms of the way we look at the property. So it's not the number one that everybody says it is from an environmental standpoint. So, but that doesn't mean that we're not interested. We're very interested because of the environmental benefit uh, for the area. So, um, and it would give us access to Jerry Lake and uh, preserve the Rosemary Scrub. So there, there are many benefits to it. We are interested. We're going to try to work with the state and with the city um, on this property, but there's, I just wanted to give you a flavor for the many competing factors that we have to go through as we try to make these decisions. Thank you, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Barry, you and I talked about this the other day. I just wanna make sure that uh, our team has a, uh, a Rolodex, a portfolio, a list of options of the different uh, public and private and nonprofit foundations that exist out in the world um, that we can go to and say, here's Project X. Does this fit your funding formula? 
Um, there's a lot of groups out there that help with these kind of projects. Pinellas County has utilized some of these in the past uh, to purchase lands, whether it was for the trail or other things. So I just want to make sure that our team is is versed in that, that it's not kind of coming from behind, that when something comes up, it's not just, well, we have X million dollars, the price is Y million, we can't do it, that we're looking at every option of every funding avenue of every resource possibly out there. Um, and I want to be like very entrepreneurial and, and aggressive when there's these kind of opportunities. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, uh, great point, uh, C Commissioner Justice. In fact, there are, and on top of all of that that you just mentioned, there are individual efforts that are being made by our residents. So there's a piece of property, as an example, up in North County, um, you know, at one off one of the main roads up there that uh, the community's also got an effort going to to raise some funds. So there's a lot of ways to do this. And I just think, you know, maybe, you know, that conversation, Barry, about, you know, the, the kind of the approach that, that, that we've developed, that you've developed with staff over the last year and a half that, you know, to try to give some criteria. But even more than that is the, is that perspective of the penny. Because when we went to the, for the penny vote for the residents, we had promises made to the residents to deliver on a whole lot of different issues. I mean, they were, you know, large categories, not specific things, but a lot of those penny dollars have been set aside for roads. They've been set aside for stormwater. Uh, some of the lands that we're looking to buy aren't in that environmental piece. They're somewhere else for stormwater, for instance. So we may have, uh, even though one might argue that $15 million over 10 years isn't enough for environmental lands and it should be 30 million, just as an example, there are other dollars that are in our, our budget in our 10 year forecast that that address other things. And, and one of the things that we continue hearing about is affordable housing. You know, whether it's, you know, whether it's at uh, 60, you know, 60 a, a percent M AMI or even the workforce housing that obviously needs some land so that our workers, our teachers, our firefighters, our policemen don't have to live in Pasco County. So we finding places here, if they go up there and then they decide to stay up there and work up there, we're going to have a harder and harder time filling those positions here. So it's a constant effort to try to do affordable housing on some of the land that's out there. I'm not suggesting the Hackworth pieces, the, the Gladys Douglas Hackworth piece is the one. I'm not saying in general, we have a, there's a lot of demands for, for land in this county, some environmental, some recreational, some stormwater, some uh, what we that I just spoke about. So I think, you know, you know, maybe having a perspective conversation like that about the penny and kind of not with in all the details, but kind of yeah. where it goes might be helpful. I think that would be really helpful for our residents to understand the complexity, but also, gosh, how much that those those ninety million dollars roughly a year that the pen that the county gets exclusively, what we do with it. And um, I think at least it puts context around it. Thank you. We, we could certainly do that. And, but to highlight your point, we, I, I have talked to the city manager, you know, since their meeting, we're going to be talking again tomorrow. We, we're, we're all in in terms of trying to get creative and find a way, you know, to bring something forward. And um, that those will, will be negotiations. Um, so not necessarily at this meeting, but we, we are committed to try and do everything that we can within the resources available. So. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions about the property? Okay. On a positive note, um, a very positive note, your team um, and um, George Remus, who are, is our consultant, he, he's, a, he's a cheerleader, but um, he has a lot of technical knowledge. I'm gonna turn it over and, and bring him on. Um, has looked really hard at ways in which we can improve our development services system. Um, and I will tell you, I've got to give a real shout out to staff because they have been bought into this. They've led different groups. We have a citizens advisory group that has provided and been a sounding board for us. Um, but they're very, very committed in working as a team to figure out ways in which to make our development process better. And if you, and I have the reports that I see and they're coming up with ideas and they're sharing ideas and George is helping, you know, bring them together and figure out strategies to do it. They're gonna go through with you today, you know, uh, process improvements, um, uh, regulatory changes, 
um, and, a, and a whole variety of issues in terms of how we move forward in this area. But I will tell you, they took this on and have done this while implementing a CELA, while having the busiest <laughs> year that I think they've ever had um, and have been challenged at every step of the way. And then we bring in the pandemic. So um, a real shout out to staff in terms of getting this far uh, during a very, very difficult time. But I wanted you to know they're committed to doing this. We're committed to making our permit process um, as, as seamless and as easy to navigate as possible. And um, so I, I, I might turn it over to George first or, or Tom. Uh, let me just make a couple, a couple of right. remarks, Barry, and then uh, Tom Amante, Assistant County Administrator. So you can introduce it and then turn it over to George and let's get going. But a uh, big shout out to staff. Yeah, thank you, Barry. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners for the opportunity. Um, uh, this morning, you're gonna see an overview, a brief overview of the work that we are doing and how do we improve the development services? Uh, George come to us, as um, Barry mentioned, with over 40 years of experience in the public and private sector. Uh, he has done this kind of work. One of the things that is um, very appealing to me that he's a civil engineer. So he, he brings that unique uh, understanding of the technical area, especially as we go through the process of reviewing codes and regulations, the, the guide how we do business in the county. Um, one of the things that has been very... Uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, uh, Brian, if you could bring, bring up the presentation, I would appreciate it. Go ahead, George. I can advance it for you. Can you guys see it okay? I don't see it. I'm not seeing it, Brian. Can everybody else see it? Yes. Yeah. Just having flipped through and just make sure you're on the same page, George. Yeah, George, it, we have it up right now for everybody. I'm not sure why you're not seeing it. Let's go. The, uh, I guess uh, if you could flip to the agenda, Brian, I appreciate it. Sure. So basically uh, we want to kind of focus on three areas today. Uh, the first is giving an overview of the process that Barry and Tom spoke of. Uh, Talking a little bit about our progress. Next slide, Brian. Oh, sorry. There we go. There you go. Talk a little bit about our progress and then some next steps and kind of upcoming up, uh, requests from, from the board. Next uh, slide. So um, the, the process that we undertook uh, from the very beginning, there's three basic parts. And the parts, part one is just understanding what the current system is about. Uh, the development services, all the various departments, the processes, the flow. The second part is really focusing on what some of the issues are from the customer's perspective, the staff's perspective, and try to understand what are some basic improvement strategies. Um, and so where we are right now is basically in, in, in part three, which is uh, trying to figure out now with based on the issues that I'll go through in, in briefly, is how do we go about designing improvements that are gonna make customer service even better than they are today. Next slide, Brian. Yes, sir. The system basically is made up of kind of six building blocks and we're not looking at just process. We're looking at process, the steps that the customers go through, the staff go through. We're also looking at the culture and that's the kind of middle block there, which is how decisions are made, how, how people work together um, and you know what, where the accountability is for, for pushing projects through the system. And then the regulation of course, uh, make up basically the bottom three blocks the important factor here is that the, uh, the tools that the staff uses, technology, space, and then how things are organized, really all work together into one, into one basic uh, system. And so we're not just looking at one area, we're looking at all areas and try to be very comprehensive as possible. Next slide. So the, the, the most fundamental part of this are the core business processes. These are what the customers actually go through to get information. Uh, and interpretation, how they get into the system. Once they're in the system, they apply, and then they basically, a big challenge is to get it to a decision point. And that's one of the major uh, aspects of trying to get the process improved. But then they have to go out and build the project. And so there's ongoing uh, construction inspection and then maintenance uh, to make sure that they stay in compliance with what the project was approved in the first place. Next slide. So the, the, uh, the, the process that Tom talked about and Barry talked about 
is that we've been trying to gather perspectives from three areas, from the customer's perspective, the staff's perspective, and then my perspective from just the knowledge and experience in, in other communities over the last 40 years. Next slide, please. The way we've structured this is that uh, Barry and, and Tom have been providing the oversight and sponsorship. We, uh, we have three basic elements, uh, the customer advisory group, and you can see the names of the, of the members of that group. Uh, we've been meeting on a monthly basis uh, from the very beginning uh, uh, when we started looking at issues. We have a staff steering committee, which is basically the directors and most of the managers in each of the departments. And then the third group is the line staff that actually work on a day-to-day -day basis with customers. So we've got this, this uh, three groups to, to help push this forward and get ownership and buy-in to the process and kind of where we're going. Next slide, please. So the, the progress to date, uh, we've, we've evaluated and documented the, the current process from the building block perspective. Uh, we have gone through and we've done focus groups and uh, a, a customer survey and staff interviews to identify some of the performance issues and also some of the recommendations. I'll talk briefly about that. Uh, we also have gone through thoroughly and looked at all code chapters and regulations relating to development services. And uh, I'll mention that a little bit later as well to look for opportunities to try to simplify and to remove obstacles that are unwarranted. And then we've also focused on some short-term improvement processes, uh, specifically, excuse me, for pre-application documentation and, uh, and looking at some performance metrics. We're in the stage right now where we're starting to develop those strategies, as I mentioned, and uh, we, we will push forward with that, uh, with those staff groups and the customer group. Next slide, please. One thing in, in my 20 years in consulting with communities, um, I've looked at a lot, of, a lot of organizations and I find that Pinellas County is probably one of the better organizations that I've seen across the country. You're doing a lot of good things, a lot of right things. You've, you've got an organization in, in the BDRS organization that, that kind of brings together all the talent from most of the departments. You also uh, have very professional and dedicated staff. I've come across a lot of staff that you know, I felt like weren't, weren't qualified. And in this case, you've got some excellent staff on, uh, in your organization. You've developed a permit center, which does co-locate co a lot of the staff, and you're using a lot of the latest technologies. Um, and you have uh, some processes in place that uh, help move projects through uh, from, uh, from a management standpoint. And then you do have the recently adopted land development code and stormwater manual. So you're doing a lot of good things. And the question now becomes, how do we improve that from the customer's perspective? Next slide, please. The, uh, the one thing that we did do uh, to, to understand uh, come some of the issues, which I'll briefly go over, is we had about 38 one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, specific customers in those groups that you see there. We also had a customer survey response, uh, about 190 responses. Uh, the, the, most of the responses on the customer survey were around the building permit and some of the permitting areas. The uh, 38 uh, interviews, a lot, were, a lot were about more of the more complex projects that we have in the system. And then we've also had this ongoing customer advisory group, which has been meeting monthly to continue to provide information about issues in the system. So it's, it was a very thorough process that we went through. And if you can go to the next slide, I just wanna hit on a few of the key issues that were raised that uh, we have now began to, to uh, address. Firstly, uh, many customers feel like the process is working very well, but they do see that there's room for improvement. Uh, the regulations they feel are overly complex, uh, especially the stormwater and environmental requirements. Uh, the uh, timelines, I, I guess uh, Barry mentioned the fact that there's quite a bit of workload in the system. They're, they're feeling like that the timelines could be shorter, should be shorter uh, in, in the process. And then the overall culture is, given the complex regulations, uh, customers felt like that, uh, that there should be more practicality, more flexibility in some of the interpretations of the code, codes that you have. And you do have uh, very significant regulations. Next slide. Um, customers also felt like that there's not a real clear and consistent process for resolving issues and making decisions uh, throughout the course of their projects. 
they, uh, they really do like the pre-application meetings, but they have wanted more documentation so that they can go forward with their project and have uh, some certainty. We have made a short-term improvement to that process, and, and the staff is documenting and pro providing meeting notes and minutes. And so customers are pretty, pretty happy with that process. Uh, staffing levels, I Barry mentioned it's uh, basically staffing levels are inadequate from the customer's perspective to actually deal with the backlog and the workload. And technology, there are some technologies that they have that actually queue the customers through the permit center, but, but the customers still have to kind of repeat information. So those are just some of the highlights that uh, were, was brought out through the interviews and through our customer group. Next slide, please. But the bottom line is we asked the customers in general, what do they see as a successful system? And it kind of organized around three basic concepts in that the customer has the best possible experience when they come to the county and that the customer's request is, is completed in a timely and predictable manner. Time and time is money. And thirdly, is that there's more of a partnership culture between the staff and the customers to solve problems and, and move projects through forward. And, and I've, I'll talk a little bit about that whole culture uh, in, in the next couple slides here. So next slide, please. Um, what we feel is missing and what we're working on right now is looking at how we can make the system more project oriented uh, and, and understand the customer's immediate objective and then uh, assign a point person that's gonna foster the project all the way from the beginning through the end. And that's a, a major aspect that we're gonna look at uh, over the course of the next months. Uh, we wanna focus on more coordination and efficient issue resolution with customers and, and that point of contact we feel will be uh, central to making things run smoothly. Uh, we wanna expand the, the performance measurement program that currently exists. We want to also bring forward those regulatory changes which I'll go over in the last slide. Next slide, please. Uh, if we do look at the project-oriented project, pro project system, we're gonna to wanna to look at the physical space. I know right now with the COVID, it's not as critical, but we wanna also make sure that we're providing the easiest access for customers to, to, the, to the county's uh, processes and systems. Uh, we wanna look at all resources that the customer get, gets, including publications and looking at the website to see if it's user-friendly and provides the information that customers actually uh, will need. And then uh, last but not least in the opportunity area is to uh, gain some benefits from the Accela program, which Barry mentioned, uh, that uh, will uh, improve tracking. Next slide. The Accela technology uh, improves uh, access, uh, Accela citizen access, so that the citizens can access the system and, and projects more. Uh, ap application tracking will be much more efficient than it is today. There will be a lot of self-service from the web perspective and uh, the ge geographic information system will also be available and also more accessible by, by the community. Uh, in the future, uh, near future, they will be adding mobile applications for inspectors and the online plan review system. So that, that's being implemented right now. Staff's going through a full training and they expect that to be uh, implemented in main live in, uh, in middle of October. Next slide, please. So some next steps. Uh, in kind of in conclusion is that we will be bringing forward some short-term code uh, and regulation fixes and, and simplifications. And we've looked at all the chapters relating to development services from 138 all the way through 166. Uh, and those uh, will be coming forward through the process. We've committed that the, the customer advisory group, which we've set up that they have uh, already reviewed a lot of the changes uh, from a high level and now as these uh, ordinance amendments are going to come through, they're going to take a look at it. The staff development review committee has to look at those and of course the LPA for most of those have to, uh, have to go before them. So we're expecting the first batch of those changes to go through this fall through that, that process and at LPA uh, before Christmas with the expectation that, that the first group of those changes will come forward to you uh, after the first of the year. We want to continue designing that project-oriented system that's, that's being done through the staff committees, uh, continue those monthly meetings with the customer group, and then, as I mentioned earlier, go live with the Accela process uh, in mid-October. Um, 
So if I could introduce the, the next two speakers, uh, we have a couple members of, of, our, of our customer advisory group um, that uh, will want to speak today. And, and uh, Robert Pergolizzi and Joe Kokolakis will, will speak. And I, I don't know which one you want to go first. Either one of you can take a lead. But wanted them to give you a perspective of what they've seen uh, through this process thus far. Uh, hi, this is Robert. Uh, am I unmuted? You are, sir. Uh, thank you. Well, it's good to see you all again. Uh, uh, as George mentioned, we started this process uh, late last year. We've been going to monthly meetings on the fourth Monday of the month. The process has uh, generally been good and we are being heard. Um, we have made uh, great progress regarding some design elements of cul-de-sac and, and T turnarounds, uh, designs that help promote infill since that's pretty much all we have left here in Pinellas County. Uh, we've made some improvements on access management standards and uh, uh, rewritten portions of the transportation design manual. Um, there's still some work to do regarding waivers and the process, but we know Tom will uh, be proactive in, in doing that. He's been great. Uh, the pre-application meeting process has been substantially improved. Uh, we're getting written results from staff um, within a few hours after the uh, pre-application meeting ends. And unanswered questions are being answered timely by staff. Uh, a case in point, I had a pre-app on August 11th. I got my written notes later that afternoon. And uh, there were a couple of unfinished items, unanswered questions, and staff was able to get back to me with definitive answers by later that week, literally within three days. Uh, the delays that we're experiencing in, in site plan reviews, and it's taken six to eight weeks to get comments on a submitted site plan. Uh, I think that's partially or even mostly to do to, to lack of staff. Um, would, would hope that uh, you would be able to have more staff on board to reduce review times in the future. Uh, finally, I look forward to our next uh, DCAG meeting later this month and look forward to adoption of cold code changes uh, at the LPA and the DOCC uh, later this year. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kokolakis, we can't hear you at all. You're, you're not muted, but if you go down, I don't think you have the right audio source selected. Uh, you have to go down to the mute button. There's an up arrow and you'd have to select a different microphone, sir. How about now? That's better. Ah, wonderful. All right. Well, good morning and thank you. I mean, I've been listening to this meeting for the last three hours. So I sincerely want to thank you for your service and for keeping us all safe. Um, I think George's presentation you know, speaks for itself and, and Robert's comments as far as the technical improvements that have been made to the processes and, and the dialogue between the engineering uh, disciplines and the county. And, and from my end of it, as a, as a contractor and a property owner, is, is uh, the improvement in the culture. And I think that starts from the top. So I, I wanna thank the commission. I wanna thank you know, the county administrator. I especially wanna thank you all for empowering uh, Tom, the assistant county administrator, and, and, and George and, and Cheryl for keeping us all on track because ultimately certainty and culture and a confidence in the system and in the processes and how they're implemented create value. And, and that value, I mean, I, I, I'm a beneficiary of it, of it as a property owner and, and the, the entire county uh, benefits from it. So I think overall, um, the changes that have been made have, will have a tremendous impact on every development, every property owner and, and staff because the culture, it already is evident, has been improved and, and the workings you know, through the entire development process from the attorneys to the engineers, to the contractors, to the developers has improved and has been streamlined. So I just wanna thank you all for the effort I want to especially thank staff for their commitment to making this change because changing a culture is hard. And again, it starts at the top. So uh, I'm grateful to you all for taking the initiative. Thank you. 
So we just wanted to provide just a, a brief overview and I appreciate, you know, George's presentation. The the real and there's a lot more to come. So you're going to see some regulatory changes and process improvement. The technology is going to implement. Uh, ultimately, you know, you saw where we bring people together. Um, so you'll see some design issues about whether groups need to be co-located. That makes it easier for them to get together to resolve issues. And I, I use George's term: it's options thinking because we have so many sites that are going to be difficult. It's not going to be straightforward. And we're going to need to think through how to work with them to where we are applying a reasonable standard to a difficult situation, you know, and that doesn't mean relaxing our environmental standards, but working with them to find a way to get them there versus just reading the regulation and say it doesn't apply. Um, and so um, I appreciate staff's work on this um, and I, I look forward to the implementation phase over the next several months. Thank you. Uh Mr. Eggers, it looked like you had your hand up before. I did. Uh, well, first of all, um, I just wanted to echo some of the comments. One, kudos to staff and what they've been through. And uh, and even when you do a kind of a, well, self-evaluation, but also an outside evaluation, it's not always easy. Um, but uh, certainly appreciate the attitude that they've brought to the table. I think ultimately, when you think we're doing this for our business owners that are trying to do business with us, but those business owners are working on behalf of our residents. So at the end of the day, we're trying to make it easier and better for our residents. And I think, Joe, you talked about certainty, culture, and confidence. I think that's critically important uh, in, in an environment that, that, that we're working in. So I just really wanted to say thank you for that. I, I'm so glad we've gotten some external uh, input. Uh, I would like the external input from our, from our consultant, but also from our, our folks that are working out there every single day. And um, to me, you know, I, with the more I talk to a lot of people and, you know, being able to have some flexibility in terms of code interpretation on the, in the field, on the spot, to me, I keep hearing that over and over. It's like, well, our code says this. And it's like, well, but there's some other, th it, it really looks good. It worked out really well. How do we bring a little code flexibility? Um, and just, just really quickly, uh, Robert and Joe, just, if you could point to just one thing that you, you think we're still gonna have, with all this effort, we're still gonna have a, a, a difficult time changing from your all's perspective. What would you identify as that spot that, well, this is government, so we're just gonna have to probably deal with that, but what's an area that we can really hone in on? It may take us a couple of years to get there, but you know, can you think of anything that, that jumps out at you? I, I think, not in the technical end, but the hardest part for staff is, is to maintain the integrity of the regulations and the systems. You want to be solutions-based. You want to work with the developers and the engineers to, to, to resolve whatever issues come about without compromising you know, your, your, your standards. Um, not every development should get built. Not every developer should get everything he asks for. And staff needs to, while maintaining flexibility, uh, hold the line. And that's going to be the hardest thing to execute, in my opinion, um, to ensure that the rules are enforced, but managed. Uh, I, I would say what I think is going to be the hardest is, is probably reducing your, your review times. Um, and I think it's because it's going to probably take more staff to do that. And, and it's not easy to find right now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that seems question? to be the challenge oh, everywhere. Yeah. No, I'm I'm done. Go ahead. Sorry, madam. Are there any other questions? Uh, madam, yes. Mom. yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question to both of you, if you don't mind, is in the development in the big developments that I have been um, intimately familiar with, either because I know the folks or I'm part of their group, is the constant request for information that you've already submitted, not just once, but maybe twice and maybe three times. And I guess I'd like to hear from both of you since you're both he so heavily involved in the process. Do you, have you been able to zero in on exactly why that is that we can't seem to just look at things and 
know that we already have the information in some manner, shape, or form? Why do we, why does it have to why do they have to keep on going back to the developer and going back and going back and going back? That has been so frustrating for so many people. We have seen that and we share your frustration, Commissioner. Um, we we attempt to make complete submittals and uh, provide all the information. Sometimes we get requests uh, for additional information, or I should say pretty much all the time we get requests for additional information and provide that additional information. Uh, it, it's just a matter of keeping in touch with staff and constant communication and collaboration that's going to uh, eliminate that I, should I say re-request for something that's already been submitted? Uh, I tend to be more proactive uh, and, and contact people and say, is there anything else you need from me uh, after I've made a submittal? Commissioner, I, I, excuse oh, me. Uh, Commissioner, I just, let me add into that. Uh, is working with the staff, and I think, uh, and, and Barry and Tom, I think one of the things that we've got to do is create advocacy for the customer. And our point of contact or project management is gonna be that, that vehicle. And it's not that staff is, is trying to delay things. I think having the customer respond and having the staff look at things, uh, we, we need to have a focus on someone being accountable for keeping track of where things are getting uh, blocked and making sure that, that decisions get made. And I think that's where we're going through the process right now of designing that. And I think that will be the vehicle uh, in my opinion, that will help with what Robert's talking about. Um, in addition, you know, it, it, it's a very complex process and projects are very complex in, in the county. Uh, the regulations are complex, but there is plenty of room for improvement to make that facilitation go smoother. Sorry to interrupt. I, I was yeah. most amazed going through this process that notes weren't kept and circulated after meetings with staff. Um, so that simple change that'll come about because of this, this group, I think will make you know, a tremendous difference in, in, in just communicating and ensuring that staff's comments are addressed and then giving certainty to the engineers that are working on all this stuff, you know, that there is a checklist and that if they comply and they meet those requests, uh, the project moves forward. So, and there's not a lot of back and forth after that. Well, I, I really value very much your input and I know that that checklist is something that we've, you know, tried to implement for quite a long time now. I certainly hope it's a comprehensive one. And my last question, if you don't mind, is uh, over and over again, I also hear, well, it's a result of the engineers not really knowing what they are doing or what the rules are. Do you find that on your end, that that's the case? Just asking. Uh, Let me take that one. <laughs> Please that, do. That was also my biggest you know, comment there that I felt that you know, engineers have a degree, they have insurance. And I think one of my biggest comeaways was that I felt staff didn't fully appreciate or respect their discipline and their training and, and there are many ways to skin a cat, especially an engineering firm. And I'm not an engineer. And I feel that um, a submission needs to be reviewed in light of their expertise and then compared with the regulations that are on the books uh, for compliance. Um, it may not be exactly the way staff thought it should be done, but you have to rely on and, and value their training. So, so one more question, my last question, Madam Chair, if you don't mind, because Mr. Kokolakis's comments made me think that, um, is, is there a, I, I'm not sure exactly how to word this, but is there a, a, um, a discrepancy or a conflict between what the engineers know is the right thing to do and maybe what our regulations or rules are asking for? I'll let Robert take that one. Well, I mean, as a planner who owns a civil engineering company, uh, we like to think we know what we're doing and we're, we're, we're not going to design something that is inherently unsafe. Uh, but with that said, there are more than, there are multiple ways to design a project, uh, all of which, you know, meet the intent of the code and will result in a quality project. 
and it's just having a meeting of the minds with staff. And we think we're well on our way through this process to coming to that understanding that although there may be a slight deviation to what your code says, um, we are meeting the intent of the code and we can result, we can have a result that's a win-win and move the project forward. Excellent, thank you so much. And thank you both for your time being here today. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for your work on this project. It really helps having that kind of input. Uh, Commissioner Akers. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, emphasize, emphasize a couple of things. Um, first of all, I certainly like all the conversation about more respect for engineers. I think that's just great. <laughs> to being, be, not being a practicing engineer, but being one by, by education. Um, really, I think that the part that you you've touched on a little bit is that we have good people, uh, may or may not be in the right place in the organization. Maybe they get shifted around to different spots within that organization. Maybe we need a few more people, but I think the part about being an advocate for the customer is really an important culture change. And I think you guys were talking about that culture change uh, so that you can, if you have that culture change, you by, by just by definition, build confidence with our customers so that we know that they have to follow the code. They have to follow the rules. They have to, you know, all of that, like you said, there's a balance, right? But but if they have that attitude of like a can do, like, how do I make this happen? Oh, well, I can't because of this, as opposed to the other way, which is all oh, these, all these reasons we can't do it. Um, I think it's a subtle difference, um, but it, it all comes back down to helping customers get through the process for our residents, but doing it safely and within the rules that we have in place. So um, I really appreciate your comments. Um, and uh, hopefully, and I know our I know our employees are probably very excited about it, and very excited about being even more responsive. So again, thank you both for being here today. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I never knew uh, Commissioner Eggers was an engineer, but that fills in so many blanks. <laughs> in the way you think and analyze things, and that's a, that's a compliment. <laughs> but I, I want to thank uh, Joseph and Robert as well and, and the entire team for the work they're doing on this. I had a question on the, um, the pre-app meeting that um, Robert mentioned. So how are we tracking that? I know we're upgrading Permits Plus, right? Permits we, Plus and Excel is the same system. Yeah, at, at this point in time, we apply for a pre-application on a pre-application meeting online. Uh, your staff member, Karen McLaughlin, is the coordinator of those. And uh, we submit information. We, we submit a plan if, if we have one, aerial photograph. And then the pre-application meeting, again, uh, because of COVID, is held online. They used to be held in person. Uh, and we go through each of the uh, comments or, or review in, in, input from different staff members from different departments. And... At the end of that, Karen is taking very detailed notes right now, and she emails them back to me. In fact, on, on the case in point that I mentioned earlier this month, I, I got the email back within a few hours or maybe the following morning. And um, they were very detailed and very accurate. Okay. I just wasn't sure if that was part of Permits Plus or if we're doing some kind of manual pro process with the emails if that's captured within Permits Plus, I guess is a question I was asking. Right. Well, currently, I, currently, it's manual. However, um, the uh, Excella program will ad advance the opportunities to keep more of those online. That's that's a discussion point they're going through right now. But uh, in any case, uh, trying to uh, keep information documented about a particular meeting like that is important because the customer wants to walk away with some certainty. You can't always have exact certainty at the pre-app stage because there's still a lot of variables, but they want to walk away with some decisions and some agreements if possible so that they can take the project forward with some predictability and certainty. And that's that's what the staff has been working on. And I think that has improved drastically over the last months. Um, uh, so sorry to interrupt. No problem. Thank you. And just last question, I guess, I don't know if this is for Brian or, or Barry. Are we on target for uh, the Accela upgrade? Yes, sir. We uh, October 12th right now is our launch date. Um, and we expect that within the next six weeks, we'll be going live with Acela. So, um, you know, I've been involved with this project for almost five years now. We did about three years of planning and almost 18 months of implementation. Uh, and I can tell you that not only the development staff, you know, the development 
community out in the public, the property appraiser, clerk finance, there have been so many people involved in this thing, but right now we're looking at October 12 as our launch date. Awesome. Thank you. One, one last question. Yes. One last question. Madam Go ahead. Um, any, any conversation uh, in all these interviews and the survey or any, any uh, push for like a location of the facility, like, you know, um, how they, how they have to come down downtown, have to find a parking place, have to go in. Is there any, any of that kind of, that kind of discussion uh, that was brought up during the process or was it more on the, uh, you know, the, the, the rest of it? From, from the uh, interview standpoint, I mean, I think uh, there needs to be an expanded amount of space for public meetings, for uh, pre-application meetings and that type of thing. So that from that perspective, we have looked at, uh, we will be looking at, at that uh, space needs. I know Barry's doing a countywide space evaluation. We do have staff somewhat strewn around the county. Most of the staff are in the 440 uh, Court Street building. Uh, but clearly one of the things that we want to have is more public space so that cut staff can sit down with the customer uh, in a, a small conference room and bring a few staff members in and try to get through the project versus having them stand at a single counter and ha have to go from counter to counter. Uh, the, the process works pretty well now, but I think uh, having more people co-located, I think the continued use of, of the Teams and the, and the Zoom type uh, interactions will help. But a lot of times there's no uh, second to having people in the same room and be able to look at each other and talk about things. Uh, so we will be evaluating the space as we go forward, but it will be as, as based upon uh, how this project oriented uh, ma management system that will start to look and, and who needs to be in what location. Commissioner, you. Uh, you, you really need to design your process and then we need to then task organize ourselves to determine if we have a permit structure in the same departments the way we have it today um, before we then look at the best space and how to accomplish that. So they're going through that process, but those two um, evaluations will occur. They're gonna occur at the back end of the process. Thanks, appreciate it. Any other questions? Okay, well. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. We look forward to the launch. Okay. Thank you. Fine. Okay. Um, go ahead. Somebody. All right. Um, so my question is, do we want to take a lunch break or do we want to go ahead through the agenda? It's a pretty long agenda. Your call, Madam Chair. Hey, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, let's take a break because I know Thank some you. people like breaks. Uh, let's come back at 1230. Thank All you. Right.
Um, let's wait 30 seconds. All right, well, let's just go ahead, Brian. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We uh -huh. are here to review next week's agenda. Barry. Okay. All right, so we'll start out by um, item number one is uh, public comment. Items two and three are items from the clerk of the circuit court and comptroller. Um, items four, five, and six are reports um, received for filing. Questions regarding any of those. Um, item seven is award of bid to Palmdale Oil Company. This is part of the uh, Tampa Bay Area Purchasing Cooperative Contract. Um, we purchase this um, um, as part of uh, the regional um, effort, and a lot of cities also participate in this. It averages, and this is for all of our gasoline and diesel fuel, averages about three, um, almost three point one million dollars per year over a five year period. Item number eight is an award of bid to American Lighting and Signalization for the um, ATMS system for the 49th and State Road 60 to 46th Avenue project. Uh, this is $1.9 million. And, I'm, and again, this is a 50% match with the Department of Transportation. Item number nine, it is an award of bid for preferred materials uh, for the 2020 countywide resurfacing, restoration and rehabilitation paving project or um, requirements. Uh, again, it's, a, it's a, a, an up to an amount and uh, they receive four, four responsive bidders. This is $7.5 million. Item number 10 is a joint project, project agreement with the town of Kenneth City for road work and stormwater improvements, uh, construction project uh, from the recreational trail on 46th Avenue from 61st Street uh, to 55th Street. Uh, the town will be constructing a new trail um, during this, and so we're working with them. The cost for the county's infrastructure is $610,000. Item number 11 is a ranking of firms. Uh, this is a requirement for our roadway transportations. This is all of our civil and traffic engineering services. They're listed within your agenda. Um, An average annual spend uh, it, it has within here over five year periods. $2.5 million, million for each firm, total of $22.5 million. It's an, and again, it's based upon an amount that's actually used. Um, item number 12 is an award of bid to Allied Universal um, Corporation for the supply of liquid chlorine cylinders. Uh, this is out of our utilities department for a five-year total of almost $2 million. Item number 13 is a countywide map amendment submitted by the city of Clearwater. Uh, this is for property located at 1176 Mandalay Point. Um, this is really correcting a mapping inconsistency uh, from 1995, which had a preservation category on some beachfront property or rental say applied. Uh, so they're asking to clean, uh, to clean this up and it was unanimously recommended by both forward panels and the planners advisory committee. You have a question? I did. All right. You don't mind? Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, on. Uh, I just wanted to go back just one real quick to number um, number twelve, um, and it was just I was just thinking about it when when Laura went through and and, and hit one of the, a, a facility that created some chlorine issues. Could could I don't know if it's today. I don't want to know where the locations are or anything. But what do we do from a chlorine standpoint? From a safety issue and that kind of thing. What I know they're wastewater plant usually generated, but are we using liquid? Are we using, get, what do, you know, that whole thing? 
Well, this is, this is liquid chlorine cylinders. I could get you more information about what we use where, um, but, but this one is specifically liquid chlorine cylinders. And the storage, is all it, the storage is all regulated by all our hazmat rules. Um, so we have all of the safety plans and precautions and notification procedures, and those are all- I understand. Yeah, I, I, you know, again, without indicating where they are, it sure be nice to know what they what that is, what those policies are. Well, I will certainly follow up on that. Thank you. Okay. Item 14, third local state of emergency. Item 15 is a purchase agreement with Florida Department of Transportation um, for an easement. Uh, this is um, part of the Highway 19 uh, North project from North Dale side to County Road 95. FDOT is purchasing a perpetual maintenance easement for ingress and egress as part of uh, their as part of their overall FDOT project. Hey, Barry, where do those funds go when we get funds for real estate like this? Where, what, what, where do they reside? Um, my, my guess it would be going back into our transportation um, um, fund, but I would have to I would have to okay. give you a specific answer on that. I'll follow up. I don't. Thanks. I'm going to say it, and then staff will correct me. So I'll uh, I'll get you a, a, a an okay. accurate answer. Okay. Thanks. Item number uh, 16 is rebuild Florida. This is uh, this is receipt of funds from. For this is the rebuild CDBG MIT general um, infrastructure improvement grant. Um, the we listed out um, in your attachment. It's um, these funds will be used for um, hardening uh, facilities at the Lowman Exchange and at Palm Harbor Community Center, Joe's Creek um, restoration and mitigation, uh, and also resiliency projects for our utilities program. Those are listed out within your packet. The specific locations. Um, item number 17 is fiscal year 2021 elite event funding recommendations from the TDC, including a waiver of elite event funding program scoring requirements. Uh, there's 16 um, elite events recommended by TDC to be funded. Total not exceed $1 million. Staff will negotiate the final funding agreements and bring those back to you. And again, well. Sorry. The, specific, the specific projects are listed within your packet, but I can certainly right. go for those if you like. So, so, Madam Chair, it seems like lifetimes on elite uh, events every time, but can you explain what the waiver for local topia is about and what the rationale of the TDC was to recommend that? Um, just that that falls into a uh, special category that um, does not have a requirement for room nights like all the rest of them do. Uh, and it came very close to scoring well enough, you know, and we, and at least one person on the, on the committee that was scoring changed their vote because they realized then that there was no room night. And the other one left it very low, but um, because that wasn't part of the criteria, they should have scored higher than they did. Okay, was there like a minimum score that a threshold that they did not meet? And that's why. You yeah, but you know what? I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. They just barely I'll, missed the threshold. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll look and at certainly it. Certainly, we can talk about it. Yeah, we okay. talked about it quite a bit in TDC. <laughs> I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Nobody likes to waive the rules. Right. Item number 18 is agreement with District 6 Medical Examiner, um, $6.2 million. I'm sorry, Commissioner Seal. Yes, thank you. Um, I was also curious, um, could you load the um, TDC applications um, onto Granicus because I didn't find them. I found yeah. other information, but not the actual applications. Oh, really? Uh, oh. You Maybe had a summary, but, but you want to yeah. see the individual applications? I looked yesterday, so. Um, a lot of paperwork, but I mean, as you know, there's probably right. probably 300 pages. Oh. Just saying. We could maybe um, 
load that one if you're interested in that one in particular. Yeah, let's, um, let's, well, I was um, also curious, um, and I thought the cultural and historical category only allowed 25,000. It does. Right, so, wait a minute. Specifically, the Martin Luther King um, parade right. is 75,000. Um, I don't think we funded them under that category. They put in two different applications. We funded one and did not fund the other. Okay. Or so we recommend they one. By the room nights then? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. I just was curious. Thank you. Uh, do you still want copies of those? Um, I'd like to see, It's is there a summary page for each application? No, no, not really. They're kind of, you know, because they have the report from last year and they have. Uh, I have a summary. I'll send that out to, to you. I mean, we have the scoring, but. Okay. That would be Why helpful. don't we have the scoring and then the summary? That would be wonderful. Okay. All right. I'll make I sure that's out today. Okay. And if I want to read it, I can probably go to the TDC um, agenda and it's probably there oh, somewhere. Definitely. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, item number 19 is agreement with Gulf Coast Legal Services to provide free legal aid to eligible residents within the county. Um, this amount is $385,000 with an estimated $238,000 to be collected from court fees. Item number 20 is the first option of renewal with the Homeless Leadership Alliance of Pinellas for bridge housing. Uh, this uh, amount not to exceed $300,000. Chris, uh, Chris, you're still have a question. Well, I don't know. You're not on there anymore, right? Um, okay. <laughs> I, how is it being utilized these days? I probably have to defer to Commissioner Peters. Aren't you on the Homeless Leadership Alliance? And because um, this was the first time I'd seen this, it looked like they served 54 families during the last year, but I didn't know. I tried to look to see again for the backup agenda item whether there was anything there that gave me more information and I didn't see too much more so um, okay and these are just general fund dollars so they don't right correct they, are, they don't get tied up in all those regulations that they were having a hard time spending That's their correct. money before okay. I can have I mean Commissioner Peter certainly can or I can have Lourdes um, um, jump on the call It'd be nice to have some kind of additional information. I agree. Yeah. Oh, well, since it was the first year too. So it was the first year. Well, it was. Yeah. Okay. Brian, can you Great. promote Lourdes? Sure. Give me one moment, oh, we sir. Don't, we don't need it now. She can. Oh, you want to do it for next Tuesday? Yeah, she can do it next Tuesday. Right. Okay. All right. We'll do it then. Thursday, right? Thursday. No. Yeah. Is it Thursday? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, sorry, next week it's Thursday. <laughs> the following one is Tuesday. Or the, right. the next, the second budget hearing is on a Tuesday. Okay, um, item 21 is a funding agreement with Catholic Charities. Um, this was for Pinellas Hope Emergency Shelter. Questions on that? Item 22 is a second option of um, renewal with BayCare Home Care for home health um, clients. Uh, this is through our homeless pro uh, program, $550,000. The details are provided below. Twenty-three is a First Amendment to a specific performance and land use restriction agreement with directions for mental health, um, for directions for living, for community development block grant funds. Uh, these are for facility improvements. Um, provides an additional $42,000. Uh, for the purchase and installation of an industrial backup generator. Um, item 24 is Corona relief funds. This is additional funds we'll be receiving. Uh, these are COVID related, but they're uh, through um, a sub agreement with the Florida Housing Finance Authority for housing assistance. 
this is a receipt of the funds. We're going to come back to you with a strategy on how to spend it at a later point. Hey, Barry. Right. I, okay. I, I noticed that that had um, that also had a 1231 deadline as well, right? I mean, the, seems right. like all of our all of these cares related funds are well, a Corona relief fund or care. It's all that got that deadline in it, right? They, they do, unless the deadline is extended, but yes, we're going to be bringing that back to you very quickly. The staff's finalizing the details on a recommendation right now. And, 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 and we've got a unified voice going out there to um, Congressman Villarakis and Chris about that extension. I know that they're, they, I keep hearing little bits and pieces, but do, do we, we need we, a... We will continue to advocate for an extension of that deadline, absolutely. Okay, well, all right. we need a letter from us, let us know. Okay. Item number 25 is a change order to a contract with Bayshore Construction for the Port DeSoto Dune Walkover Project. So on this one, you have an active project. However, he addressed, um, Paul saw a number of safety issues with handrails, et cetera, and stuff. So he wants to extend those to address those while the contractor is on site. Uh, that's the purpose of this change order. Item number six is a grant application with the National Fish and Wildlife Federation National Coastal Resiliency Fund for uh, Old Tampa Bay, uh, Felipe Park Seawall Enhancement Project. This will, this project will really give us baseline water um, and wave energy monitoring site assessment uh, and 60% design. This will, they're gonna use this as a demonstration project um, for the impact that that would have on our coastal projects. Item number 27, this is our NPDS. It's a countywide stormwater and uh, most municipalities uh, participate, not all. Um, and so it is how many? All three. Yeah, all but three. So 21 of the 24 and those have their own, uh, they do their own resiliency program, monitoring program. Item number 28 is an agreement with uh, Gulfstream out, Outsourcing Specialized Billing for Liability Claims. So this is a pilot project out at our ambulance billing where you know they're, they're taking a portion and they're trying to outsource that. Um, and this is specifically related, related to some liability claims in these transports um, that'll both try to, if, and if it's successful, then they could expand it. They're trying to utilize a different uh, firm that would help them. That way they can focus more on their traditional billing practices. Um, so this is um, them trying to be creative to try to meet their needs. Um, Madam I Chair, I think Commissioner Peters has a question on that I'm item. Sorry. Yes, Commissioner Peters. <clears throat> Actually, it's not on that item and I just thought about it and it might not be appropriate to ask now, but Barry, um, it's really not a question. I just want to ask you if you could um, send out, do you ever send out um, how many minority owned businesses do we contract with? I mean, I'm That's looking at all these contracts and I'm just wondering, I'm assuming we have a minority owned business program, but I'm not sure that we do. And if we do, could you get us information about how many out of all the contracts that we have? And it doesn't have to be right away because I know yep. lots of people are busy, but. We actually owe you a report on that. And um, so we're gonna be bringing that back. We do have that, that was launched before I got here, uh, right Commissioner Welch? And um, uh, you, uh, they, the, the commissioner stressed the importance of this program and our staff's really, really ramped that up. It's, um, and so we, um, uh, one, I'll, I'll send you the program details, um, but two, we, we actually, it's been a while with the pandemic. We haven't brought that back. I met with staff on that not too long ago. And we owe you a report because it's been a while. So we'll okay. We'll, can we'll you let us some, know how many are female owns? We we do. We have. I think we have the breakdown. Um, it, they, we we don't. It's not. Um, um, I don't know if it's gender specific or um, it, it's small and emerging businesses and they're qualified. Um, I don't know that we break it down by race um, or gender, but I'll have to I'll have to check in exactly what type of detail we have on that. Thank you. I appreciate it. I know it wasn't the right time, but I appreciate it. Yeah, we'll follow up on that. We, we, we've been, um, that's one of the reports that we need to get and uh, get scheduled onto this agenda. Okay, where was I at? Um, oh, ambulance. Okay, um, next is um, 
and this is an interlocal agreement item 29 with Hillsborough County for limited solid waste processing. Uh, this, in, this, in essence, enables us to work with them or them to work with us if we have downtime at our uh, waste energy facility. Item number 30 is a resolution to waive the um, utility department customer late uh, fee connections. Um, as you know, we did a suspension uh, for normal bill billing practices during the, uh, during the pandemic. We went resumed normal billing practices August 1st. However, there's late fees that accumulated uh, $668,000. Uh, this action will waive the late fees. They'll, they'll still owe the regular amount, but let waive the late fees. Item 31 is a, an amendment to the project agreement with the city of Largo for utility relocations along Rosemary Road from the Pinellas Trail to Missouri Avenue, about uh, 1,100 feet. Um, this uh, the additional county work cost about 500,000. Item number 32 are appointments to the Emergency Medical Services Advisory Committee. 33 is appointments to the Emergency Medical Services Medical Control Board. Thirty-four is a resolution to adopt a restated plan document to amend the cafeteria plan. This is really related. It's it's um, adjusting the maximums and the federal requirements for the um, FSA uh, allowable um, spending uh, for deferred uh, and um, making those changes. Madam Chair, I think Commissioner Seal has a question on that one. All right. Yes, Commissioner Seal. Thank you. I'm just curious. I couldn't find it. What is the amount increased to? And I guess it just goes through, it says through 2020 only. Yeah, I, I would have to check back on that. I don't know if it's uh, part of the attachment or not. I'll have that answer for you. I didn't, I didn't see it as part of the attachment. So okay. thanks. I'll make, I'll make sure we load that up. Um, I, I, I didn't look at that to the specific amount. So I'll have to follow up on that. Thank you. Under item number 35, um, this is an action that you all approve every year. This is from the tax collector. This is a resolution to approve the early extension of the rolls so that the tax collector can get the tax bills out prior to the conclusion of the value adjustment board process. And under items 36 and 37, these are both code enforcement cases. We are asking for your authority to uh, file injunction actions in each of these cases. And I do not anticipate having any reports. Okay. Item 40 is an appointment to the Feather Sound Community Services District. And uh, 41 is amendment uh, to the Board of Com for the Youth Advisory Committee. So, um, Madam Chair, just to give you an update, the youth have um, kind of rework the ordinance. They, they want to extend the amount of time that they can spend on that board. Currently it's a school year and they want to do a full, uh, full year. Um, they've been working over the summer. They want to continue it as a full year so that the term would be from the day they get appointment appointed until the day someone else gets appointed. So it'd be a one year. And um, just an FYI, if you have not paid attention to their Facebook or their new YouTube channel, these kids have done amazing work and they didn't let COVID stop them. They had to wait for legal to start meeting again on Zoom. Um, but when they, when they got back together, um, they picked without any influence of me, and I know you might think I'm not telling the truth, but it's definitely true. They picked mental health as their priority because they didn't like the mental health training that was being provided in the schools. And so while they were out of school, they invited professionals and they held a, a webinar on mental health issues with the LGBTQ community. They held webinars on mental health issues related to suicide. And then they also held a webinar on substance abuse and every one of them are exceptionally done and the information is amazing. They've done a great job. If you haven't checked their Facebook page or their YouTube page, the videos are there. And, and it's all done by these kids and the questions are very important and intense questions that really impact youth and their perception and how to cope and, and get resources to get help. It was really amazingly done. They wanna keep up their work. 
Um, so you will see changes that they want to amend on membership and, and things like that next meeting. They're doing a great job. They will be presenting to you. Um, and I think you're going to be quite impressed with the work that they've done. So I do encourage you to watch the videos. Um, and while I've got the microphone, I do want to let you know that next week I'll be um, submitting some um, uh, MSTU requests for uh, the Treverty Community Association. It's about 15 thousand dollars and I just wanted a heads up you don't have it now but you have it probably this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, commissioners. Um item 44. Um this is the Grand Canal. <laughs> and so there's several changes um associated with this updating our processes and things like that. And Kelly's gonna walk through that with you. Um this enables us to move forward on that project um and um the, it assesses the method for um, collection uh, for an assessment. And so, and the, and the next is item 45, and this is uh, an ordinance uh, for golf carts up in the Ozona and Crystal Beach area. So this establishes um, a, the zones, establishes the regulation associated with them being able to access ties into uh, the Dunedin, you know, area and how people can move around via golf carts. Okay. And then finally is a resolution adopting the 10 of millage rates, rates and budget for fiscal year 2021. All right. Um, let's go ahead, Dave. Yeah, just real quickly. I wanted to, I, I had talked to one member from the youth advisory committee and, um, she, I wanted to just say thank you, Commissioner Peters, for your leadership in this area because she's she's so excited about what's going on, um, and and she tends to be a little quieter, but she was real excited about uh, the efforts that are being made and is looking forward to being reappointed again uh, for another year. But uh, just wanted to say that and say thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I would like to ask uh, Commissioner Peters, if I may. Um, in your in the proposal from the students commissioner wanting to extend their length of term on the on the board does do they want to stay past the time that they graduate from high school do you know they um, they just agreed that they wanted to make them one year term so um, we do get drop off and if the drop off happened maybe during the two months where kids were going to college um, I don't think they're concerned about that. The drop-off hasn't been, even with COVID, we didn't see the drop-off we expected. Um, and they just feel, and many of the students that uh, participate are underclassmen. And so they strongly feel that they want the experience. Now this year, they couldn't do the tours at government facilities that they wanted to do. And they couldn't really dig into the, the justice and local government, like the sheriff and, and the courts. And they just feel that 12 months would give them more time to not only do the work they want to do, but it would give them more time to learn more about government. So that if that's a path, a career path they wanted to go into, it would give them more time to truly experience it. Um, so they aren't concerned whether it's seniors that are leaving on, on that kind of drop off. Thank you. The next, the next, and the, I guess this is more of a comment, but it occurs to me that you are doing an incredible job with this program in engaging the interest of these students. And given that, that it's done as well as it is, it could potentially be a bench for uh, county government human resources to hire these folks in apprenticeship programs as they work their way through school. So I'm a big, uh, believer in trying to raise up these young people to get involved in public service and county, local, and state government. I think it's fascinating for them. Thank and it's you. Okay. And it's okay, Madam Chair. I just want to respond to Commissioner Long. Um, I think it's interesting that the kids have determined that they want to survey any kids that are participating in meetings and webinars. And um, the questions they're asking are great. Um, but the reason they're joining or the reason they want to join, they just had a meeting yesterday on the open house to, to re-up. And one of the highest marks was learning more about government. Um, and I think this pandemic has really generated a lot of interest in local government. 
and all levels of government and what the responsibilities are. And so I'm really excited. I mean, I'm really excited about these kids. Um, it is not adult driven at all. We've really empowered them to take over and, and run it. And, and they have far exceeded any of our expectations and our expectations are pretty high. These kids are amazing. Thank you. Look forward to the presentation. Um, I have one question. Uh, we have gotten several requests to um, have a meeting that's in the evening so that we can take public comment. Normally we wouldn't do that at six o'clock um, on our regular public hearing night, but I'm wondering if we wanna do that since we're only having public hearings once a month or so, um, do we wanna take public comment both at two o'clock and at six o'clock? Commissioner, before you answer that, they, you, you do have two public hearings just for clarification. Right. One does start at two. The next one on the 22nd doesn't start until, oh no, I'm sorry. I looked at it wrong. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay. Um, Commissioner Peters. I have no problem doing public hearing at six o'clock. Um, I think that it's really important, especially now, and especially with some of the fatigue that people have an opportunity to have their voice heard. So I, I don't think it would impact us if we have to extend our meeting an extra 30 to 40 or 50 minutes if people want to talk, just my opinion. I would support doing it. Right, my only concern would be if we had a lot, it would be pushing back those public hearings from a time certain, but uh, Commissioner Seal. I would agree. Um, and I would venture to say that <clears throat> you probably people can comment on any agenda item um, anyway. So uh, we have the local state of emergency. And then I was looking to see for citizens to be heard was on the afternoon agenda. I didn't quite find it yet. So it's the very um, first thing. Okay, sorry. <laughs> So um, I think that uh, we, via Zoom, that we have the ability to hear people and there are good points made. One reason why we do the budget in the evening is so that people can be heard. So um, given the circumstances, I completely agree. Okay, uh, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. I totally agree. I don't wanna be redundant. I would like to ask though, that perhaps we ask our citizens if they speak in the morning to not you know, call back in in the afternoon because we tend to hear over and over from the same folks and it reduces the opportunity for new people to get in the queue. And, and to that point, if I could, I would recommend that you only have one citizens to be heard on the agenda you do have the local state of emergency on during the daytime, well, the earlier portion of your meeting where people are going to have an opportunity to speak. If you put it twice on your agenda, you're creating two opportunities and giving people two opportunities to speak. And so the same person would have that opportunity. Well, so they would anyway. That we, so that they're would, going to be able to speak on they're going to be able to speak on the local state of emergency um, under that regular agenda item, which is earlier in your agenda. I think it's 13 or 14. So that's going to be during the two o'clock portion. Right. Um, if you wanted to move citizens to be heard, I'd recommend you put it, um, you know, initially at the six o'clock portion if you want to have it in the evening. But keep in mind, you will have already acted on the local state of emergency. Um, right. But, you know, people will still be able to express um, comments on matters of a general nature. Or if you wanted, if you wanted to keep them together, we could push the um, local state emergency to the, you know, evening. Mm. Just a thought. Think about that, um, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you made the comment about our public hearings, and I think that we do have to be sensitive to that. But we do have, for instance, in this month of September, I'm not, I'm not sure how many weeks, the four or five weeks that are covered. We probably have two meetings or three meetings that aren't public or that aren't commission meetings. And we could move one of those to the evening as instead of having it the time we did today, 9.30, we could have it at six o'clock and just do what we're doing tonight. You know, 
not the commission meeting where the normal business takes care of it, you know, what we're doing like today. So just an alternative so we don't affect that, those public hearings, um, pushing them back too late. Um, well, I think now that it's, <laughs> now that it's been proposed, it's probably too late to do that, but um, <clears throat> I'm okay with pushing the local state of emergency to six o'clock. I mean, that is what people want to talk about. So we'll change the agenda, put the local state of emergency at six and the citizens to be heard um, right before that. Right. And we should all take a nap in the afternoon. Um, okay. Okay. Um, yes, Commissioner Justice. So do you want the citizens to be heard at the two o'clock and the state of emergency at six so that you get the general comments at two and then the comments that we're talking about really at the six o'clock portion of the meeting. And if someone wanted to talk about COVID in general, they could talk about it during citizens be heard at two. It would be two opportunities for folks depending on their schedules. Well, it's not what I want, it's what we want. So um, we could probably cut out the citizens comment at two since we do that week after week after week in the morning and they can still talk on any item we're voting on, including everything on the consent agenda. So, um, and then have general citizens comment at six. I don't know how people feel, people feel about that. So, so what's the, what's the, is the, is the idea to, to do one meeting a month at, so they can speak at six or later, or are we going to do it like more often than that? Like, because we do meet five, four or five times a month now. Right. We have four or five opportunities to alter our schedule. So it's not just, not just commission meetings. So. Well, the question was, do we want to allow public comment at night, general public comment, because we don't usually do that in our six o'clock part of the meeting. So we have been asked and, and, and I think that would be a good thing to do. Um, we have to have a separate public comment at two o'clock. I don't necessarily think we do, but Commissioner Peters. So the only reason why we want to take it away from two is because you have people that are accustomed to that and when we change it and keep changing it, I, I think you stay with what we always do at two o'clock. And then if you want to give an opportunity at six o'clock, I think you give an opportunity at six o'clock. Um, I think every week for the last several weeks, we've expected a couple hours of testimony and they haven't been as long as we thought they were going to be. We have two public hearings. It's not that many. Um, and we don't know how much longer we're going to be doing this. It might be a long time, might not be, but I would, I would hesitate to change what is the norm because people are already used to the norm. They're used to it at the beginning of the meeting. And I think if you take that away and then the next week it's there, there's not consistency and continuity. I think you keep it in the beginning. If you wanna add it at six o'clock, I, I have no problem with letting people talk even if it's a second time. <laughs> you know, we're there, you know they, they're our boss, they elected us and we need to listen to them. And so I don't think it's a problem if our six o'clock meeting runs a little long, um, but I, I would hesitate to change what we normally do in the beginning of any meeting because that's what people are used to and we should keep continuity and consistency. So okay. does that mean, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Um, does that mean then if we, and I, and I kind of agree with the having a public comment in the beginning and then at six o'clock having a public comment and state of emergency both so that we continue with our public comment in the in the afternoon and move the state of emergency uh, because that's why they're calling there it'd be right. kind of silly to have the state of emergency in the afternoon and they're calling to talk about the state of emergency in the evening and we've well we've already taken that action um right that's why i suggested we put it at six yeah yeah i think but it's a good idea only, so, i mean we've only been doing this once a month and I, actually in our normal <laughs> life, if you can remember what that was like, we only had one evening meeting a month. Uh, so, you know, I think it's 
I think one of them should be open at six o'clock for comment. So, all right. So we can do that if any, unless somebody has a huge objection to that. Have a public comment in the beginning at two o'clock and at six o'clock. Yep. And move state of emergency to six after public comment. Okay. However, I will consolidate if I can, Madam Attorney, if I have public comment and then immediately after have um, state of emergency, do I have to have two comment periods for that item? I, I think it depends on, on what the expectation is. I feel like if you give people advance notice that you're going to open it up for both purposes, the way that you have been at, at the meeting today and, and the last meeting and some others, I think you're fine. Um, but you do need to let people know that once you open up that general comment period at six, that it is going to be for both the citizens to be heard and the local state of emergency. Because from a legal perspective, what you're required to do is give people an opportunity to speak on the items that you are going to be voting on prior to taking action. The citizen comment is not something that you're legally required to do, but it is something that's very common with local governments. And obviously, we've done it for a very long time. So legally, you have to give people the opportunity to comment on the extension. So yeah, I think it is um, legitimate to put those two things together, but also as you have been doing, um, advise people before that open comment period starts that it is to cover both, both the citizen comment and the local state of emergency. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Seal. Can't hear you. Commissioner Seal, we can't hear you. I, I think your uh, input might have changed, your source, your audio source. Do you have a Bluetooth or something? <laughs> Still can't hear you. How about now? That's yeah. better. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I just turned it off. I The jobber has been great, but <laughs> something went haywire. <clears throat> um, I just had a citizen text me asking if they have <clears throat> five cards, whether they can get 10 minutes. And I don't know how you would handle that, Brian, with this Zoom technique, but I, I was asked to ask the question. If they have five comment cards? Is that, yes. Is that I mean, we don't Which typically comment. in our agenda allows somebody 10 minutes to speak on behalf of a group. So I don't, I don't to, know how you handle that with Zoom because it's almost impossible. I'd have to divert, defer to Jewel. I would have to double check and see if the procedures that you adopted to govern these virtual meetings um, has any um, you know, guideline in that regard. But I agree it would be nearly impossible to enforce and would note that you're providing two opportunities for citizen comment and a um, you know, multiple other agenda items. I, I, I don't know how we enforce it. Um, you all are very uh, pretty, you know, pretty rigid in enforcing the five people have to be there and in person so that you can verify that um, they are actually speaking on behalf of a group. I've seen Don kind of turn his video on. He wrote your procedures uh, for these virtual meetings. So I'm going to defer to him to see if he has anything to add. We discussed this uh, a lot and tried to come up with a logistical, practical way to deal with that initially. Um, for the time being, that had been removed from the process because of the virtual nature. And exactly the point Joel just made is uh, it's virtually uh, impossible to, to uh, tie the people who are physically there uh, again, uh, especially with the phone numbers and all that kind of thing where you can't see names, you don't know who's what. Uh, and so we had simply removed that for the moment, uh, again, with uh, each of the people having, and, and again, to Jules point earlier, there's nothing in the law that requires that at all. It's purely a, a, an accommodation that the board has historically made. But um, frankly, we were building the airplane as we were trying to fly it uh, to try and get this together and have these meetings up and run. So uh, that was one thing that fell by the wayside. Um, if you'd like, we could look at another, see if there's some other way to do it. The reference to, to cards, obviously virtually we don't have cards. So uh, it, we'd have to come up with some other mechanism 
there are a lot of moving parts that that we try to manage and Brian does a great job of dealing with along with the clerk and others involved. So um, frankly, that was something that we just couldn't find a good way to deal with at the moment, but we can look again. Well, I, that's what I was going to say that Brian and company have done an incredible job keeping the movings, the meetings moving and, you know, dealing with this whole public input thing. I, it seems like from a clerk standpoint, you'd have to have names and addresses of all five of those people because they have to go in the record and they would have to be present online at the time that the person that was representing them. So I, you know, I don't think, <laughs> yes. Well, um, just, just complicating that. Uh, when Brian has, you know, 80 people showing up as participants right. and they're trying to find those through the list, it, it's just very, very logistically problematic. I think he has plenty to pay attention to during our meetings. So, uh, yes, Commissioner Walsh. I just wanted to note, Don, if you can put your camera back on, that you did say virtually impossible. I just... <laughs> 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 taking on the mark that was intentional, that right? so yeah thank you madam chair <laughs> all right so uh, let's not do that for now um anything else yes pressure justice on a completely separate topic is that all right yep <laughs> um we received uh, or i received uh, uh pictures from uh, residents in Safety Harbor about Philippe Park, about the uh, treatment of weeds. Um, and this is something we talked about a couple of years ago. And I know that we get back from parks that we were following all the practices by the chemicals and all of those kind of things. But a couple of years ago, we talked about taking an examination of how we use these chemicals throughout our facilities and whether or not it was, even though we're following all the procedures, whether or not it was the appropriate uh, way to control the weeds, to control the growth there, or whether there was other options. And I know our parks was looking at it, and I just don't know that we've ever had that uh, report come back to us and, and have a real discussion on it. And I just wanted to bring that up for the administrator and because and, uh, I know I have, I have gotten some communication on it. Well, I can answer that. The, um, it is going through a review period right now. So, um, so Jennifer Bramley from the, the city manager, City of Deneen and I co-chaired um, a, this task force where we brought all of the parks and recs and um, folks from throughout all the municipalities together um, and really kind of put together a kind of a model ordinance that everybody could use. They could, you know, it's not mandatory or anything like that. Um, and so they're, they're looking at those types of practices. We, and we've, we learned a lot. They learned a lot about um, when you have alternative chemicals of what whether pe how people are applying them or, or because it's not as effective, are your crews actually putting on three times as much um, to be able to control the, you know, the weeds or whatever. And so they went through a very lengthy process to bring together a report that now we're having vetted. And so we're taking that out to some of the environmental groups, we're taking that out to others to make sure we have everybody's input as part of that. Um, we are then going to bring that out um, and roll that out simultaneously to the cities um, and to the commission. Um, and it, again, it's a it's a best practices document and it's a guide. That is what we're currently following, but we will be bringing that to you soon, as soon as that vetting process is over. And, and does that include a conversation of it, it's it costs us X dollars to do the chemical and it would cost us Y dollars to uh, obviously more to do it manually and those kind of options it, it does and there's there's a practicality to being able to get in areas and simply pull by hand weeds um, there's also um, limitations when you use certain types of alternative chemicals and we actually had a professor come in talking about when you apply if, if your crew you know who's responsible out there separate from the director who's actually out trying to, to work in the park and he applies double the amount of the environmentally sensitive, it actually has a, it's more environmentally damaging than if you would have just used the Roundup to begin with or something like that. So they went through a lot of different iterations and 
discussions about the practicality of how to apply it. Um, and again, it's it's a it's a guide, um, not a mandate or anything, but it but I think it'll actually make us more uniform in terms of how we're um, applying different practices in the different areas, whether it's close to a body of water or not, and and other things like that. So we're we're working on it. We're very close to be able to bring it back to you. Okay, I think it's important. Um, you know, Pinellas is a leader on on how we treat our environment, how we have. Uh, with the fertilizer ordinance and those kind of issues over the years. And, and I want to make sure that we're practicing what we preach. So I appreciate that, that it's coming forward. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, anything else? Yes, Commissioner Long. Commissioner Long, you're muted. So at, at the risk of bringing up and opening up a, a, a wound here with several of, of um, our citizens, I'd like to see if we could have a quick discussion or summary, Barry, if you know it, about the noise abatement issues at our Pi Airport. I've had um, on and off discussions via email for the last week or more with one of our favorite citizens from around that area who has a big issue with the noise, number one. And so, I also have chatted with uh, Mr. Tom Jewsbury, and I don't know if he's listening in or able to speak to the issue. Mm -hmm. And I did talk to Mayor Ayub in Safety Harbor to find out if there was a, um, a growing number of complaints from the other citizens in Safety Harbor about the flight path. And I did find out from Mr. Jewsbury that the flight pattern has changed a bit as a result of the construction going on in and around the airport. It's not forever. Um, yet this continues to be an issue. And I, you know, I kind of sort of feel the, his anxieties a bit because our home is also in a flight pattern. It's not always Allegiant. Sometimes it's Southwest. A lot of times it's military aircraft and they are really loud to the point where they'll often shake the windows up, um, in the rooms upstairs. But to, that said, you know, I, I'm, I know we're not gonna move McDill and we're not gonna move Pi. And so I'll let my, my comments linger here and wait and Barry, if you can weigh in or I know Commissioner Egros has had some of those conversations as well. So thank you. Well, I defer to Commissioner Eggers. I would really want to have Tom here to discuss it because it's really um, a, a question of the patterns, but also the limitations that we have regarding controlling that. Um, and so I, I think to have a fruitful discussion, I, I would need this um, Tom to be to weigh in on that. So could we could we. Um, invite him to come to our next meeting and give us an update so the whole board is aware as well. Sure. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, I just, um, <clears throat> you know, that they're using the uh, cross runway right now. Uh, there's the work that's going on on the, on the main runway. So um, I know that, for instance, they were given permission as they, as they take off into the northeasterly direction to come back to a certain degree and they couldn't, they, they had to go that far away from the Tampa airport. And Tom, uh, because of his connections, and they were they appealed it to the to the Tampa airport area and they, they declined it. And because of his co connections, he's trying to get some uh, leeway on that so that when they turn to the north, that they don't have to turn quite as far, you know, and take it over Safety Harbor. So he, he's actually going, uh, you know, a, a around the system a little bit to try to get, I don't know how that stands and it'll be interesting to get that take. And the reason I mention that is I really feel that the, that the airport guys do a really good job of pushing the envelope. Um, I, I can say that, you know, we can tell, push it harder with Allegiant, you know, they, they, they've been using the, the attitude of, well, it's COVID, so we have to clean a lot longer and a lot. And so our planes are backed up and all that. But it, it sounds to me like they're, in addition to some of those late arrivals, they're actually scheduled now, it, late into the evening or early morning, instead of just being pushed back. So um, 
I do know that, that, uh, that our guys there are very sensitive to it. Um, we continue to push them a little bit. So even when somebody might, you know, after a while, you do it so much, you probably get a routine and you, you forget to do it for a while. We always remind them, please keep allegiance on their toes because that's, that's not just a legion, it's others too, but that's the one we have the commercial relationship with. So, um, I, I, you know, I feel good about our group out there uh, pushing the envelope. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I guess it's, you know, we want to have an airport in the county. We want to have the, the allegiant here. Uh, we just want to push them earlier than 11 o'clock as much as we can. But I do know that he's working hard in the interim to try to get that turn away from Safety Harbor a little bit more. So that's a good thing. But look forward to hearing from him at the next meeting. If I can, I'll, I'll put that on for September the 17th. Um, and that gives us a little time for him to have up and us to see what he's going to present. That's okay. Okay. Anything else? Not. We are adjourned. Thank you all.